um, call this meeting to order. Um, so first um, thing is really to re review and approve the agenda. But actually, before we do that, I'm going to take a little bit of um, mayor's privilege here and uh, just have a, a quick statement that I want to make. Um, yeah, I know, uh, I think I speak for the council when I say that we were all uh, disheartened and deeply saddened by the shooting deaths of Asian Americans on uh, March 16th in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, to, so to our Asian American and Pacific Islander community in Montpelier, uh, we want you to know that we see you, we're grieving with you, and we condemn the acts of violence toward the AAPI community. And we're committed to making Montpelier a safe place for you. So while some members of the council were actually working on drafting up a resolution condemning AAPI hate, there was actually another shooting in Boulder, Colorado, which taken together, I believe demonstrates a, a broader problem of, uh, or a broad problem of gun violence. Uh, I find it personally incredibly disheartening that a return to normal includes a return to regular mass shootings. I would urge us to have uh, hard and honest conversations about the role of guns in America with the people in our lives, our family and friends and our neighbors. What does responsible gun legislation look like? <clears throat> and also, uh, I'd like to just point out uh, that there's a bill in the Vermont legislature right now, S30, which would prohibit the possession of firearms uh, in hospitals. That's not obviously the whole solution, but it's a reasonable, uh, albeit small step toward gun safety. And I, I think uh, we may end up uh, hearing some more about that resolution uh, a little later, but I wanted to make sure that I um, started with that. Um, so having said that, um, uh, the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. Is there um, changes to the agenda? Are there changes to the agenda? Uh, Donna. Um, I would like to make one <clears throat> that we insert looking at a letter to support a grant that the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition is applying to support their CAN activity. How uh, are others okay with that? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, so we'll do that after. Actually, let me just look at this. Uh, yeah, so we'll do that. Uh, I think probably, if it's okay with you, uh, if we could do that after the homelessness task force presentation. Is that all right? It's, it's that slightly later than I had suggested. Do you think that's okay, um, Donna? Yes, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Um, yep. Any other changes to the agenda? Oh, yes, go ahead, Lauren. Um, I, I did draft a resolution um, as uh, the mayor referred to condemning the violence against um, our Asian American and Pacific Islander um, neighbors. And so if people are interested, I could share that. I apologize that the week got away from me. So I could email it around if people um, wanted to consider that later, I could read it out. Um, it's very consistent with previous resolutions that we have offered, um, just condemning that, um, that violence and reaffirming our commitment to be a, an inclusive, welcoming uh, community here in Montpelier. So if people are interested, I'm happy to offer that or we could do it next time if people would prefer. Um, others thoughts on that? Yeah, Jack. I would suggest we do it tonight when it's uh, timely. And if uh, Lauren, if you send it around now and if we could take it up under the other business and then that would be sure that we would all have a chance to read it during the break before, uh, before we get to it. I'm sure I agree with everything you say in it, but. Agreed. Okay. All right. Um, if it's okay with you, Lauren. Oh yeah. So as Jack suggested during um, other business, is that okay with you? Okay. All right. So uh, we'll make those changes. Any other changes? Okay. So I'm not seeing any. We'll consider the uh, agenda approved with those changes uh, without objection. Um, so the next thing is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. 
Uh, and if you would say your name, uh, where you're from, and then um, uh, try to keep your comments to two minutes or less, that would be fantastic. Um, this um, is, sorry. Uh, sorry. This is That's okay. Hughes uh, from District 3. Okay. Uh, and I'm rising this evening to uh, really say that we are very fortunate to have a, a well-trained uh, police department in this city. Uh, the police department uh, responded to our crisis bed uh, in the city and dealt with a serious crisis that I was supervising. And I got to see for the first time the actual uh, work that goes on with the police officers when they negotiate uh, with somebody. And uh, we are top rate, I believe. I just want to thank the police department and uh, the officers of that night as well as, well as Chief Pete. And I'm encouraged uh, by Chief Pete's uh, meeting coming up. Thank you. Oops. Thank you, Zach. Um, uh, Bill Kaplan, and then we'll, then we'll go to Bill Frazier. <laughs> I was going to recommend Bill Kaplan, so I didn't okay. see Okay. Go ahead, Bill. Okay. Hi. Um, so I am, we're not on the agenda, but I am um, reporting back uh, on a quick uh, note about MDC. Um, I want to thank each of you for all your work. Every time I tune in, I'm just uh, really grateful for the work you do and feel <clears throat> like uh, everyone should see these meetings. And, um, you know, when we tune in, we see the public uh, service that you all do. So thank you for that. Um, so last time MDC was before the uh, city council, we were asking for the commitment and it was during budget time. And, um, you know, we had a good conversation and, and did a kind of a, a recap and where we were at. And we had a proposal that we put um, before um, people there. And, um, and so um, I thought that it would be good to recap um, the accomplishments of the last five years of uh, MDC and um, and then kind of go and um, and and talk about where what MDC's kind of coming back with um, as a, a path forward um, and so um, I think that just to, I'll just run down a quick tick list um, and I'll try and stay within the two minutes here um, that eight, we had uh, eight employers that attracted and retained over the five years. Um, 74 businesses received over $200,000 uh, from the MDC men fund as COVID persistence funding. Uh, we had the creation of the uh, tax incremental financing district, the TIF uh, district in Montpelier. Um, all these, we played a, a role in supporting and, and, and helping happen. Um, the bond was approved by the voters for the parking garage. Um, Caledonia Spirits um, was selecting, opening, and, and now is growing in Montpelier um, all during this time. With, uh, new downtown hotel committed and planned uh, opening this 80 room hotel in a downtown, you know, chose Montpelier downtown versus the a national norm of going out by the interstate um, uh, for an off-ramp site where they um, have proven track records. But I think Montpelier was put in a light uh, by uh, the whole um, process to be a great downtown for the people to come to. Um, 30,000 um, additional visitors annually now come to Montpelier. There are 100 plus new jobs. Um, provided uh, funding for the COVID uh, business navigator through Montpelier Alive. Uh, we've since provided another um, program through Montpelier Alive uh, for um, post-COVID business growth and attraction. Um, and um, I think that's a pretty quick uh, summary. Um, as we approach the end of the five-year uh, commitment that MDC, uh, that, that Montpelier gave to MDC and um, the, the, the end of um, what we consider our, our charter, uh, we are, um, can you see me? Yep. 
Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Because I can't. I can't see anyone here. I don't know what happened. Um, anyway, we, we're um, we're now uh, looking at what. Oh, there it is. Uh, where where, um, where we can go and what we can do. Uh, we currently have um, one hundred twenty-two thousand six hundred dollars uh, in the bank. Um, we're thinking about what we can do. Uh, we have met with uh, Bill about possible structures and pieces um, uh, how to move forward. And I think that what the board unanimously decided was to uh, wrap up the, um, the five-year charter with one uh, large um, business uh, and economic uh, development program where we would have lasting impact um, similar to what we've done here, but bringing people in and putting Montpelier in the light of, um, of a place to grow and, and, and uh, bring your business uh, or, or organization. Um, we're going to be focusing on um, businesses that are um, women or BIPOC owned uh, will be giving substantial um, uh, grants. Will people qualifying for this money will be um, basing their operations here, uh, not just a single outlet, but really uh, the idea being that one of the recipients or all will contribute to the idea of when you get up, when you go visit someone in another place and you say you're from Montpelier, they'll say, oh, that's where X is from, or that's where this is. And I think that um, the idea is to create um, just a lasting economic impact uh, with, our, with our final um, kind of program here. Uh, we'll be coming out with a press release and a, and a, um, and a program and application requirements uh, piece, but it will be, you know, we've talked about it. it it's not, it, the, the application will be very accessible to all, um, all people and all, all types of businesses and organizations um, with the idea that we'll have a, a, um, a programmatic way of waiting. Uh, but the idea is when you, when you bring one of these places to here, they've committed to be here long-term by either signing a long-term lease or buying property. And then uh, we look forward to seeing what that happens over the next 20 years after that happens. With that, I guess I will, uh, I can answer any questions if that's appropriate here, or I could sign off, whatever works. Great. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you, Bill, and please uh, pass along our, our gratitude to uh, the, the whole board. Um, you know, I, I think uh, the, 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 this, this plan you have uh, for the remaining money, I think, uh, makes sense. And, um, and uh, yeah, it's been, uh, I think it's, it's been a really good thing for uh, Montpelier. So any other questions, comments? Um, yes, Dan, go ahead. Uh, I'll just add on, I, you know, I want to thank you, Bill, and the MDC for, you know, the work you've, you've done. I know that there have been uh, challenges and setbacks to the MDC, but I think the work that you do is important, and I certainly hope that in addition to the grants, um, we can continue to um, tap into the knowledge that you've gained um, in running this corporation for the past few years as we think about economic development and Montpelier in the next phase. So certainly um, it will be helpful to us as a city. Sure. And, and I'd like to say, you know, that was a, when Bill uh, and I uh, spoke about this, Bill did ask me to ask the board, you know, uh, the level of um, interest of others to continue and serving or, or being a part. And I think that everyone um, to a T um, agreed that if there's an issue or something that hits on any one of the board members, um, you know, as we ran this um, not-for-profit corporation, everyone volunteered in their skill set and we had a deep, deep uh, knowledge base that uh, everyone wants to continue to use to enhance uh, and 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 assist Montpelier going forward. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Okay. Yes. I, All right. I have um, my hand up. You get Morgan. Yes. Brown. No. I'm sorry. I meant. I meant anyone. Of the council want to uh, speak on this particular issue. Um, was there anyone else um, from the council? Uh, okay. Uh, Morgan. Oh, yeah. thank you again, um, Bill. Yeah. Go ahead, Morgan. Morgan Brown, uh, District Three uh, resident. Um, I just want to request that uh, people not use acronyms because it shouldn't be assumed that everybody knows, you know, what an acron acronym might mean. And unlike the city council, maybe, and the mayor, we don't have acronym handbooks, maybe, you know, and uh, maybe that's what we need, you know, create an acron acronym handbook. I'm being facetious, but please, you know, you use acronyms and then I'm trying to figure out half the time what the thing is and then I'm not listening, you know, because I, I'm preoccupied, you know, what's that mean? And it would just be helpful to use plain English. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Morgan. That is an excellent reminder. A very good call. Um, other, uh, uh, Peter. Yes, go ahead, Peter. Yeah. I. I... I'm going to get to my in, in a second. I totally agree with Morgan. It, is, it drives me crazy. And it's not just acronyms. It's Bill. Let's identify who we're talking about. Let's not feel like we're a club. OK? And I, I, I saw this when I was on, on other on committees. New people come into this city all the time. This is not a way of making people feel welcome. It's a way of making people feel excluded. OK, I want to say something nice about um, uh, the uh, city services. Um, I, I just have to say that the um, Development Review Board, board I'm sorry, Peter, Peter Kelman, District 3. Sorry. Uh, the Development Review Board and um, the Department of uh, Planning and Development, I think, are really doing a great job of implementing the desire of the city council and of all of us to increase housing in, in Montpelier. I, I, I had this personally a great experience with them really helping to push something through, to facilitate it, to get it to be done in an appropriate way um, that, that will hopefully lead to some more housing. And um, it, it's a very good sign, I think, that your intent is trickling down into the operations of, of in an area which in past years, I felt it has not been uh, the case. So uh, thank you to them. I want you to know that they're doing a great job. Thanks. Great, thank you, Peter. I appreciate that. Uh, Bill, yes, go ahead. Well, I hate to add on to uh, general business when we normally have none and we have such a distinguished guest waiting for us uh, that I, uh, I don't like to do this, but we had, had received an inquiry from uh, folks who run All Species Day and we did not get their application in in time for this meeting. The next meeting would be April 14th uh, and I've sent you all out information about this so I won't repeat it all. Uh, and I think for their planning purposes, that's running it pretty tight to a uh, May 2nd event, ARC GNS Valori for now. And so um, I think they're looking for some kind of signal from the council whether you will consider this or not. I mean, obviously, you could say, let's see what the circumstances are on April 14 and decide then, and they have to decide whether that's enough time. I'm not trying to sway you one way or another. I, you received our recommendation, which is under the current guidance and current state of emergency. We don't really feel this is allowed and we shouldn't be doing it. But uh, as Dan Grover pointed out, that could change in the future. So I, I again, I'm not suggesting you hold a full hearing on this. And I know there's other agenda items, but I do think out of courtesy to them, uh, either now or later in the meeting, if we can give them some guidance, that would be great. Thanks, Bill. Um, Thanks. Just, yeah, um, I, for one, am really looking forward to All Species Day, but I, I don't feel, I'll just speak for myself and say that I don't feel necessarily good about having an event for it uh, yet. Um, 
and if uh yeah if we could just take the temperature really quick that'd be great uh, donna then lauren well I, I would just suggest putting it off yeah i know it's attached to a day but trying it later in the summer when we're more apt to be open and have less uh, restrictions um lauren yeah i guess my question i think for janice is you know is there you had kind of cited a couple other city events that still happened. They were done differently this year because of, you know, not wanting big gatherings of people all at the same time. So um, I, I think the only other way I think I would feel comfortable is if, if it's being reimagined in a way that doesn't create that big, big draw of people all at once. If there was like a, you know, people show up and there's some, you know, some of the amazing puppetry or something on the state house lawn that people could come look at, or if there's some different iteration of it that would fit within the state guidelines um, to keep everyone safe from COVID. So I guess that would be my my question or consideration. Anyone else from the council? If not, that's okay. Sure. Yep, go ahead, Connor. No, I just, I probably agree with Donna. Um, I think it's a really special event that people look forward to. And we're, we're moving in the right direction. We got a third of us vaccinated now. So if we could put it off later in the summer, I think it would be a, a great opportunity for folks to come out and enjoy it um, and really celebratory like it, like it's never been before. So um, I, I think just maybe give that some consideration and would, would be happy to work on it. So I'm hoping that that is, or was anyone else from the council want to weigh in? I'll just uh, note that okay. uh, again we'll be open. What's that? July 4th weekend's available. <laughs> right, right. Um, well, I, I hope that's helpful feedback for now, Janice. And um, uh, we, you know, we, we want to, we look forward to it. We want to be supportive, um, you know, for when it is safe. So, uh, or, or a vision of it uh, that doesn't necessarily involve uh, uh, crowds, uh, all gathering at the same time in the same place. So, um, but thank you. And, uh, and I, yeah, I hope that you, yeah. You know, well, find... is it possible that we can have um, the permit on the, well, April 14th, I actually have a Plainfield DRB member uh, meeting. So it'd be hard for me to attend the April meeting to have a, a deeper conversation, but I'm hearing that possibly another time or when the rules change on a state level, we can have this discussion. That's what I'm yeah. hearing. So maybe not the April 14th, because I can't attend that one. But maybe sure. the the one later in April will have different will have guidelines by then. Sure. Yeah. That seems Does that work. Jack, go ahead. Yep. Yeah, it would be April 28th. It would just be tough to pull off for May 2nd if if you go ahead, Jack. Yeah, I think that uh, certainly the the council is open to hear from people. I, I think the message you're getting from uh, those of us who have spoken and from me who I haven't spoken yet is that uh, it's not likely to be uh, to be to be met with approval if you come to us in April either. But uh, we're supportive of trying to make it happen sometime, even if it's we're looking at at September instead of uh, May. You know, depending of course on what conditions are at the time and we're all hoping they'll be much better all right well i'll get back to you when i when new guidelines come out okay yeah. thank you okay thank you for your time for sure um anyone else for general business and appearances uh yeah steve whitaker go ahead steven um uh, i want to I've, I've asked that this be brought into an agenda item but i think it didn't make it in time or uh, Donna was preoccupied with other emergencies, but the uh, the fiber bill that Consolidated is conducting across uh, all of uh, Montpelier and neighboring towns is creating huge disruption. Uh, the flaggers are not uh, trained well. They're not paying attention. They're not even watching traffic. Uh, a lot of some of the fiber is being installed illegally close to the electric lines. Uh, they are just blocking sidewalks at both on, in both Elm and State Street at the same intersection in both directions. Uh, it, 
it's really reckless, and we currently don't have an ordinance that requires them to notify City Hall and get permission for that type of construction. And um, another dimension of it is our uh, negligence in uh, withdrawing from uh, EC fiber uh, on the consent agenda, uh, despite my protestations earlier. Um, so now we're going to have a second monopoly provider across town, but we're suffering all the consequences of traffic disruption and hazardous conditions. They had all of uh, all of School Street blocked, uh, both lanes. They, they, the school pickup happened at the same time as they had a truck out in the traffic lane outside of the parked cars, uh, stringing fiber, and the, the guy had to sit for half an hour to get out of the funeral home uh, because of that gridlock. It, it was a dangerous situation if a police or fire uh, vehicle had been necessary. Um, but again, apparently we have no, and the reason I'm bringing it up is because Consolidated testified in the Energy and Tech Committee that they were having conversations with every town and letting them know when they would be where and getting them fully cooperative and informed about what was going to go on. And I did a public records request and found out that none of that was true here in Montpelier. So I'm, I provided some draft ordinance language to Donna that from a, you know, a, a model code that had been adopted by a city in New Hampshire. Um, but I, I think you all need to act on this uh, sooner than later. They're head next heading to Barry. I've given them the heads up, and they were very appreciative. But it, it's not okay to have uh, – also, that code allows the committee in in the city, uh, a committee of, like, the public works director and the planning director, et cetera, to go in and force them to clean up things that have been hazards, removing double poles, look out at the – the wires hanging outside of the right of way, pole right of way, in front of the guest house on School Street down near the school. You'll you'll begin to notice this stuff, and once you do, it'll bother you as much as it bothers me. Um, I hope. Uh, secondly, the uh, again the cruel and callous disregard for public restrooms. I while I appreciate the in intent of you know consoling the Asian American community, we've got people here who cannot use the restroom, old people, people with children, et cetera. And there are no public restrooms and y'all are, you know, negligent at dealing with it for over a year and a half now. Um, the vacuum cleaners, don't forget the vacuum cleaners uh, that can be purchased with the money that's coming our way. I think Congressman Welch is going to tell you about. Uh, we need to get the dust up out of the sidewalks and the streets and the crosswalks because people are eating it and it's toxic. Um, and we should conduct a public process, not just city council's discretion with the bit, you know, the mayor and the city manager in a back room with cigars. We, we need a public process for how to spend this money that's coming to the city. And secondly, we need an inventory of all the public works uh, backlog of projects a photo inventory that allows the public to scan it on the web and help rank it and prioritize what gets repaired when, because it's going to take 10 years to dig out of this hole. So um, that's enough for now. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Jack. Uh, thank you. Um, I was, uh, I'm, I'm interested in the idea of a ordinance relating to the uh, cable installation. I can imagine that there may be some, uh, federal or state preemption issues regarding for, because it's uh, in interstate uh, commerce, but uh, it does sound like something that we should be uh, looking into. And so I would encourage us to, uh, to explore that. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, anyone else for general business and appearances? Okay, all right, so we are gonna move on to our consent agenda. Um, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Uh, Jack, go ahead. I move the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? 
Okay, so the consent agenda passes. And so we are up to uh, welcoming our uh, Congressman, Congressman Peter Welch. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we're, we're looking forward to, to hearing from you. Well, um, I, I want to say what a pleasure it was to participate in the citizen comment. Uh, you know, there's nothing more real than local uh, politics and local government. And I so enjoyed hearing everybody's comments. Uh, Steve talking about what's going on with broadband and on the sidewalks. Uh, the fr you know, the frustration about acronyms. I got to tell you, I share that. I just got, in, you know, when I got on a new committee, uh, the Intelligence Committee, it was just one blizzard of acronyms after another. So <laughs> I, uh, I like that idea of an acronym dictionary. I, th I think that's great. But Mayor Watson, thank you. And to the members of the City Council, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be with you uh, briefly this evening. And, and I just want to make a brief report about the American uh, Recovery Act and uh, be available for questions and also to let you know that uh, we're here to help you with the implementation of that in your city. But as you know, you know, it's really quite amazing about what's happened in our country with this pandemic. It's a once in a hundred year event and it, none of us are ready for it. How in the world do we prepare uh, for something that hasn't happened in a hundred years? And it was a year ago, uh, literally just about a year ago when I remember uh, going out to the uh, airport in Washington for the 10 p.m. flight home. And I got a call from American Airlines. And the question was, uh, Congressman Welch, are you still planning on going to Vermont? And I said, well, yes. And I was curious why they asked me. And they said, well, as soon as you get here, we're ready to leave. And the reason was, the, a plane that was normally totally packed was totally empty, except for me. I was the only passenger. And what it symbolized was how sudden and abrupt it was that we went from a fully engaged economy where fully engaged interactions, in-person meetings at the, the city council in Montpelier and everywhere else to uh, social distancing, apprehension about the, the virus, um, rightly so, uh, and a shutdown, like in Montpelier, of your restaurants and your small businesses and your schools. Uh, it was just stunning. And it's a year, uh, a little over a year that we've been doing this. Now, the good news is that we have vaccines. The good news is that shots are going in the arms of uh, Vermonters and Americans. And we can see that the end is in sight, but we have to do two things. One, we have to maintain uh, precautions, the mask, the social distancing. We've got to get and we've got to get vaccinated in order for us to get to the other side. And the second is we've got to hang in there with economic assistance to our families, uh, to our uh, small businesses, and, 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 and what I'm going to talk about tonight is to our local governments. Uh, but the, the Recovery Act that we passed, just signed by the president a while ago, a couple, about a week ago, number one, vaccines, they're paid for. That is not, that's going to be a federal responsibility, not a state or a local responsibility. And those, they we're doing over two and a half million uh, vaccinations a day. So we're on track. Uh, I think Governor Scott said in Vermont to have a semi, semi normal uh, July 4th. That's really good news. Uh, second, there's real assistance to individuals. And we all know that the impact of this virus has been variable. You know, some folks and some businesses have done well. They have been able to continue operations with their internet. Some of our big companies have done really well. But a lot of the small businesses have really struggled because they can't open or our arts and uh, nonprofits really can't open until people are really safe and fully vaccinated. So this rescue package has aid to individuals, you know, $1,400 checks. A family of four in Montpelier could get $5,600. Um, and also uh, one of the things that's so significant in this legislation and something I've long been a champion of, and I know many Vermonters have, is the child care tax credit. Uh, we have a scandalous uh, amount of child poverty in this country. 
and the child tax credit is going to mean that families with a child who is six or under will receive a three hundred dollar a month check to help with those expenses. And a child who's up to age seventeen, that family will get a check of two hundred fifty dollars. So you have a lot of citizens in Montpelier who will one get the check of fourteen hundred dollars, and number two will get that uh, child care tax credit. And by the way, on the child care tax credit, it's refundable so that if a really low income family doesn't pay taxes, they actually can get the benefit of that check in the form of a direct check from the treasury. So that'll help. But the other thing that's really relevant, obviously, to you uh, as the elected representatives uh, of the citizens of Montpelier is the aid that goes uh, to our state of Vermont, but particularly uh, to our cities and towns. And before I get into the specifics of that, we had a big debate uh, on a lot of things in Washington, including about state and local aid. And uh, I was disappointed that at the end of the day, we didn't get a bipartisan vote on this. I always think that if we can work together and buy in together, ultimately it's better. Uh, but I gotta say, a lot of my Republican colleagues were very supportive of including local aid. And the reason is that you and Montpelier and in all our communities around the state have had to deal with a lot of the impacts of COVID on your businesses, on your families, uh, on your schools. And in the legislation, Vermont, the state is gonna get $1.2 billion the state of Vermont all together, and about 200 million is gonna go directly to our cities and towns and to our schools. And Bernie, Patrick, and I were all strongly, strongly in favor of that. And the other thing we were very in favor of is giving our local communities, our elected officials, maximum flexibility to best decide what is the best use of that for the citizens that you are representing. So Montpelier um, is going to get a total of $2.158 million. And there's some arcane formulaic provisions that you don't need to get into, but there's been some confusion about this. That money goes, part, the 729000 is a direct uh, uh, amount that goes to Montpelier, and then an additional amount, $1.429 a million is the so-called county allocation. Uh, and the reason that it's a little confusing is that in most uh, uh, states in the country outside of the Northeast, uh, there's significant responsibilities for county government. That's not the case for Vermont. It's not the case for many of our New England states. So bottom line, Montpelier is going to be receiving $2.158 million dollars. Your school district is also going to receive uh, funds, and the Montpelier district with Roxbury is going to receive $2.257 million. Now, when are you going to get it? The first check, half of it, half of the amount you're to get, is to be sent in 60 days. The balance, the second 50%, is to be distributed uh, in a year. Now, the next question is, how can you use it? And as I mentioned at the beginning, Bernie Patrick and I argued for maximum flexibility for local officials. And the reason I, I think we argued for that is, um, you know, I, as you know, served in Montpelier. I served uh, as a state senator. But I always had a sense that when it gets down to the micro decisions about what's the best way to do things, the closer the decision maker is to where the money's going to be spent, and, I'm, and the closer that decision maker is to the people in whose behalf the money is going to be spent, that person has better insight and more accountability on how that money is used. So I am a big proponent of giving that local responsibility to you. And by the way, it's a huge responsibility because the decisions you make are going to really impact the well-being of the citizens of Montpelier for years to come. So that is a huge responsibility that you have um, as locally effect, 
elected officials in this pandemic. But it's a the money has to be for COVID related purposes, but that's pretty broadly defined. Uh, so it can be everything from assistance to households or local businesses that have been particularly impacted to nonprofits uh, to impact in industries. Um, it also can be used for premium pay for frontline workers. Uh, it also can be used for lost revenue that is related to the city that's lost that, that's related to uh, COVID. Uh, it can also be used for infrastructure projects like water, sewer, and broadband. And that's a huge challenge for many of our communities. Um, you can also use it to partner with nonprofits. If, uh, in some cases, uh, some communities are partnering with nonprofits to do food distribution. Um, so it's a significant amount of money. There's significant responsibility and significant flexibility in the use of that. And uh, I, I want to say thank you uh, to you for serving, all of you, uh, Mayor Watson and all the members of the board, uh, for taking on that responsibility. Because if we're going to restore confidence in government, and people are losing confidence, it really is going to depend on how effectively we execute on the delivery of help in a meaningful way to the citizens we represent. And in many ways, I regard your job as far more challenging than my job. You know, it's a, it's a real mess down there, a lot of partisan division, and it's not pleasant. We had January 6th and I was in the middle of it. But my job is simple in the sense that it's to try to get resources back to Vermont and to Vermont cities and towns your job is to then make those micro decisions. How best can we use it? How can we make this effective? How do we decide among the competing interests that are seeking uh, access to this? And that's hard and challenging. And it's the work of democracy. So I just want to end by saying thank you for the work that you do. And to conclude by saying that there will be regulations that are being written and there'll be some frustrations as this is rolled out and what you can do and what you can't do. And we saw that with the payroll protection plan, where in some cases, the regulations that the governmental agencies that were responsible for promulgating them did so in ways that were in conflict with what many of us in Congress intended. We're here, and Rebecca Ellis, my state director, is on the uh, call with us. Uh, we're here to help you through that. And I expect that if my peer does face a problem because of some regulations, you're not going to be unique. Roxbury will have that problem. Uh, uh, Randolph will have that problem. And we want to make sure that you reach out to us and we'll do everything we can, uh, Mayor Watson, to assist you so that you can make the most effective decisions in the use of this money as possible for the citizens you represent. Uh, thanks so much. Great. Thank you, Peter. Um, I have a, a couple of follow up questions, but I'm sure other folks do as well. Um, I may jump in here with with one. Uh, you mentioned uh, money for that the money could be spent uh, for infrastructure uh, and specifically mentioned water, sewer and broadband. Um, how uh, does tr uh, traffic related infrastructure fit into that or does it? I'm not sure how it does. The regulations are going to have to be written, and they're not written yet. Uh, so I don't know that the traffic, it's got to be somewhat COVID related. So I think when you're looking at this, try to make the connection to COVID. Like I can give you a bright line example of what, you, what a, a state or a community couldn't use it for. You can't use it for pension fund shortages. Okay, that a lot of communities, a lot of states have pension shortfalls. Those are real issues that have to be resolved, but they're not related to COVID. Uh, so that's not a, a that's not an allowed expenditure. Now, if there are some, if you can make some case about why uh, traffic related is, is somehow related to COVID, not, <laughs> you've got some creative people there, uh, you may be able to do that. 
Well, you know, just for example, like we, we did have substantial uh, loss of revenue. And so there were a number of projects that, that didn't happen. Um, because the revenue loss revenue. you can do. If yeah. You can fill in yeah. the holes, but it, the, the, if it's a COVID related revenue loss, you can use this money to fill in that gap. Right, right. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, Bill, go ahead. So, and then Dan. So just on that point, so if, to, I just wanna make sure I'm clear about that. If we, if we had to reduce our budget, because of COVID related revenue sources. And we put those funds back and, and as the mayor mentioned, we cut certain projects or equipment, you know, and I'm not talking about like staffing or anything like that, but just specific projects. We can replace those, we can replace that revenue and use the money for those projects that we'd had to, to delay. Right, you know, under the, under what we, what, what we passed, I think the way it would work is this, if you have revenue loss that's specifically related to COVID, you can use the money to replace that revenue. So then you now have the revenue that you lost and, and you're entitled to use that revenue for municipal purposes. Great. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. I appreciate it, Congressman. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Sure. I, I had a quick question. Uh, when you talk about the county um, pass-through of the money, it, how was that exactly allocated? Was it divided evenly amongst the communities within Washington County or was it, you know, is there any money staying at the county level? Because I, I think your point is exactly correct, you know, because we have such a weak county government in New England as opposed to Western states. Yeah, it it, 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 I don't believe money stayed at the county level. I mean, we basically had to do a workaround, not just for Vermont, but for the New England states that traditionally have not had a significant county government. But in a lot of the rest of the country, as you know, the county does have significant responsibilities. So um, the, 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 we couldn't have a tail wagging the dog situation in terms of the distribution. You know, the vast number of states do have county government, so there's a county distribution, but that was in lieu of the, li the local distribution, okay? Then the county had to work with the towns. So I'm actually quite happy with how it worked out for us in Vermont, because we have that check going directly to you, even if there's a reference to this formula uh, that acknowledges the county structure that exists in the uh, majority of the states in the country. So I think you get the direct check on that. So it's almost better not to talk about the county because it just creates confusion for us in Vermont. Um, you, you're gonna get your money. Well, thank you. Um, Lauren and then Bill. Uh, thanks. Yeah. I mean, first of all, thank you, Congressman Welch. I, I know you downplayed uh, how hard a job you have, but we really appreciate all that you've been doing for, for us all. And it's an incredibly important and hard job. And we're really grateful that you're representing us. Speaking for, speaking for myself, you. I really appreciate all you've done and um, some great work here and really exciting for the, the opportunities. Um, one quick question on um, the date. I know some of the state dollars you have until like 2024 to spend. So any clarity right. on kind of timeline for spending? Um, and then a quick question on, um, we also got an email today about um, a, a small number of community projects. And just curious if you could get, give a little guidance. I know it's only kind of a handful you can put forward, but kind of what you'll be looking for are those kind of shovel ready kind of projects for, from communities or is there uh, wider okay. latitude? Yeah, just, well, just any guidance well, that would be great. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, uh, uh, two things. One is uh, there's, there's separate thing. There's two separate issues that you're talking about there. One is yeah. the, what you are going to get uh, yeah. with capital spending authority under the Relief Act. Yeah. And I described that and there's also money that goes to the state for capital projects over 112 million. And actually you can apply for that, but the state will be the decider about whether the application you have for your project is the one that gets funded. All right, so that's gonna be in effect a, a competitive process, but the state has a pot of money that is available to be distributed to municipalities for these projects. That's number one. Number two, separate from the, the, the Recovery Act, uh, Congress has decided with Republican and Democratic agreement that we're gonna allow for congressionally directed spending, you know, formerly known as the earmarks. And those were abolished for 
the past 12 years or so. Uh, but those projects are ones that can only be spending for nonprofits, municipal projects. Uh, and you can, you can, you, you, you actually can make your case for that uh, to Patrick, Bernie, and me. And we will be uh, trying to coordinate as best we can to maximize the benefit. There's real limits on how much is going to be available uh, to the House and to the Senate and to each congressional district. So I don't want you to get your hopes up, like everything you have can suddenly be transferred to me for uh, <laughs> getting the money. But uh, take a shot at it. Let's tr let's try. Uh, so that's this. So you've got a couple of avenues here, three really. One, the money you're getting directly, where you have a lot of maximum control. The money the state's getting, where you have a shot at competing to get some of that money to help you in your efforts. And then third, uh, talking to the congressional offices about whether we can find a way to get an appropriation to assist you in your work on behalf of the citizens of Montpelier. Thank you. It's really helpful. Go ahead, Bill. I, I, I had that same question, Congressman. Thank you that Councilmember Hurl asked. But do you have, I, I realize you can't, you don't know for sure, but do you have a sense of the size and scale of those type of things? Or we have, we have projects that could conceivably be eligible for that kind of earmark thing that, you know, are as high as seven or 10 million to others that are 1 million to others that are. I think, I think that would be high. I think so that what, do you have any high, sense of the, the sort of cap yeah, these range? We're, we're, getting, we're getting the guidelines. You know, it, 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 I just want to be clear here. Yeah. We, we, just, we've got all these towns, you know, 254 in Vermont, and everyone's got a big project. And the reality is the needs are great. I mean, you're, you know, contending with uh, incredible infrastructure challenges in Montpelier. Um, and all the communities are going to be interested in getting whatever money they can to assist them in their projects. Um, so I think it's something where it's worth pursuing, uh, but I wouldn't bank on it. And then the amount of money that would be available, I think, is relatively small. And it might be something that would help make the numbers work, but it wouldn't be something you could count on to pay the, 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 the full tab. Um, now, the other issue that's now going to be a primary concern to the Biden administration is certainly something that's been of concern to uh, your congressional delegation uh, is an infrastructure package. Okay, so we've talked about what has passed and what is available. The, the American, you know, the rescue, act, the, the rescue recovery package, the money that goes to the state, and then the, the earmark or directed spending that uh, will be available to your congressional delegation. But we're talking now, the Biden administration, about that uh, long discussed, much supported, but very elusive infrastructure package, which would include spending on local uh, water and sewer. Because the situation Montpelier faces, the situation that so many of our communities across Vermont face is there is real deferred maintenance and a real inability to re realistically ask the taxpayers to pay the full cost of that, the property taxpayers. So my hope is that we're going to be successful in passing an infrastructure package. Great. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? for the congressman. Uh, go ahead, Connor. Sure, so welcome to Montpelier, Congressman. We're, we're so hey, happy Connor. to have you. And, uh, I was at Bearpond Books yesterday. We did a, we did a, we had a nice uh, press conference uh, uh, with Claire Benjamin on uh, the incredible charges from Visa and MasterCard on swipe fees. But, so I was in Montpelier, it felt good to be Physically back. in Montpelier, that's right. I was physically there. <laughs> Well, great. And uh, no, just thanks so much for the work you're doing. We, uh, I think with one representative, we really punch above our weight and it shows uh, down in DC. Um, just want to switch topics really briefly if I could, uh, because I did see you were a co-sponsor on the Justice and Policing Act, uh, which John Lewis, you're in good company, John Lewis, I think was one of the lead sponsors on right. this. 
Um, and we're doing a lot of work um, in Montpelier right now, trying to keep up with best practices. Uh, Chief Pete, who's come in, who I hope you've met, um, really brings a wealth of knowledge. We've talked. Yeah, um, we've talked. But, but I, I was hoping you might just, just give the top lines of what the Justice and Policing Act looks like and how it might affect you know, some of the conversations we're having with our Police Review Commission. Well, you know, one of the things that's really relevant to you is that there's actually more money that is available for communities that are taking on uh, the challenge of reforming our policing uh, practices. So, you know, far from taking money away from police, it's actually saying, hey, we understand that if we want to change policing and focus on community policing and engaging, uh, that involves training, it involves money, and we want to help financially with communities that are willing to take on that responsibility. So, you know, I would see that given what Montpelier is doing and the leadership that's providing on uh, policing practices, uh, the Justice and Policing Act is right up, uh, is very supportive of the efforts that you're making uh, in, in Montpelier, including with the potential for financial support for the expenses associated with really good uh, training and, uh, and also encouraging uh, communities to have inappropriate oversight. Uh, you know, so you work for the people, the police work for the people, the electric part works for the people. Ultimately, we're all accountable to the people. And I think justice and policing understands that. So Connor, you guys are doing great work. And, uh, uh, you know, we've, we, we passed that bill in the house, it's pending in the Senate. And we, that's where, will they take it up or won't they? That's the whole filibuster question. Thanks so much, Congressman. Thanks, Connor. Any, any other questions? Uh, Jack, go ahead. Not a question, just a comment. I really appreciate your being here and uh, all the work that you're doing for us. When I uh, talk to people about why Vermont has the uh, best congressional delegation in the country. It's you, Peter, and Ber you, uh, Patrick, and Bernie, and I really appreciate every everything you did. Jeff, that's so kind of you to say. Yeah. You know, I'd be glad to come back anytime to hear you say that. That's awful nice. Of you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, but thank you for your work too. It's a pleasure. All right, any other uh, comments or questions for Congressman? Uh, yeah, Dan, go ahead. Sorry, what, what, one, more, one more crack at, um, uh, when you consider the infrastructure, I guess I would in, encourage, um, you know, we're struggling with uh, unifying uh, public safety authority and particularly dispatch throughout the region. And so any funds that could be made available through infrastructure and I know you're already probably thinking broadly about it, um, but but certainly that type of um, radio antenna network that we're still trying to make sure that we coordinate and, and fully serve in this region is, is certainly going to be helpful. And I'll yeah, it go. is. No, we're 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 aware of that. Um, you know, I'm on the Energy and Commerce Committee, and we're talking a lot about. Uh, that and the problem you're describing is shared in many communities across the country. And the fact is we've got to have a reliable system uh, that is, doesn't stop at the town line, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, we're all in this together and I'll just echo the other co uh, counselors and thank you very much for your work because we really do have an amazing congressional delegation. Um, when I went down for ABA day, it was always the easiest we had the easiest job of all 50 states <laughs> delegation. So thank you again. <laughs> well, that's good. well, we're all pretty proud of our state, aren't we? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, anyone else? All right, well, I um, just wanna add my voice to the gratitude. Thank you so much, Congressman. Uh, we're so grateful for everything that you're doing for us uh, down in Washington, and uh, you know, we're, we're particularly appreciative that you came to us to, to this council meeting to give us this well, news that, that directly affects us. I'm it's, glad I'm glad to be with you, and Mayor, I'll see you out riding your bike pretty soon. We're getting the weather where you can do that. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully soon. Anyway, yeah, thanks thank so much you. for being here. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. 
Okay. All right. So, uh, all right. So we are up to uh, the home energy uh, labeling ordinance uh, for the first uh, reading. So the first thing I'm going to do is open the public hearing. Uh, but just so that, <laughs> just so that everyone knows the order of how this will go. Uh, there's a, um, a presentation that the group that was working on uh, putting this together uh, has has got for us, and uh, I, I and um, and Councillor Hurl uh, are both a part of that. And then uh, then there will be uh, an opportunity for the council specifically to ask clarifying questions. So that's a time to. Um, uh, maybe not opine yet, but uh, to just to get more information or clarify things. Um, then we'll hear from the public uh, after that. And then after uh, after we hear from the public, then we will um, go back into um, discussing this as a council. So that is, that's the procedure. That's how uh, we're going to move this forward. And uh, so just to get us uh, kicked off here, I think Cameron will be sharing the slides. Uh, with us and I think Donna is starting us off um, so I guess I will turn it over to Donna. All right can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay great. Um, so um, for everybody's benefit uh, good evening my name is Donna Barlow Casey and I am Montpelier's Public Works Director but I'm here tonight as the city staff member appointed to the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. Um, and I'm going to just take you through a little bit of the overview. And then um, there are other members of this organization or entity that will um, take turns explaining the different aspects of this. Um, so in 2018, this little bit of history the City Council made a significant and what some might say was a bold environmental commitment. They decided that it was in the best interest of residents and the city um, to engage in actions that would result in diminishing and eventually leading to the elimination of fossil fuel use in the city by 2050. Now that's a long time, it seems like a long time in front of us, but this is um, work that takes a while to um, be realized. And so the work that has been ongoing has achieved some milestones, which you can see um, here on the energy goals slide. Um, and there are more to come, including what we're talking about tonight. So, well, the adoption of the ordinance that's before you, um, everyone tonight is not the only effort that the city has helped that's, I'm sorry, that the city has um, considered in regards to net zero, it's a critical component in achieving what the um, commitment is for the city. So the, tonight is the first of two required meetings, and that's important for everybody who's here thinking about this and learning about it for the first time. Um, and the second one will be at the next council meeting. Um, and there are a number of uh, consultants and community members who are very adept at explaining not only this ordinance, but the benefits that are going to be provided to the community as a result of this. Um, they'll be answering questions, referencing data, explaining the process and benefits that can be expected when the ordinance comes to fruition. But there's been a um, pretty important misunderstanding that we've been hearing about, at least I've been hearing about it in public works and through social media. And I want to um, address that at the front end of this conversation. Um, the home energy information ordinance does not require homeowners to invest in making energy improvements to their residences. Now, that's not to say that we don't want that to happen, but it is not a basic requirement in order to adhere to the ordinance. Um, it does require owners to fill out what's called the Vermont Energy Profile. 
And you'll see and hear a little bit more about that um, as, the, um, as we go through slides. But um, the VHEP, as it's called for short, um, is important in that, and I want to put this in context for you, um, while it can be a selling point to some buyers, it's not the only selling point. And, it's, and while it's really important um, in the long run, and it, it may be a very big incentive to a number of folks, it is one of many points that potential buyers will look at. And so we've heard an awful lot that this is an unfair um, situation for some homeowners. Um, and I really want to reflect for a few minutes here on the fact that when any home goes on the market, there are a lot of situations that um, result in people buying a particular home, the size of it, the location, how many bedrooms it has, its condition, um, does it have a yard? Does it have a driveway? There are so many things and the number of homes that are available at any given time when people are looking to purchase um, may be limited or they may be a very broad range. And so the home energy ordinance is one of those many decision points that buyers will consider in their effort to fulfill what they are looking for, which is a new home. And so if I accomplish two things tonight, one is to hopefully hold that line of um, upset that we've been seeing, as I mentioned, um, being discussed um, at a point where people can really look at the ordinance itself for its benefits and for um, its benefits in the short run and its benefits in the long run to our community and beyond that as a model. Um, and so um, at this point, um, at this point, I think that we're turning this conversation over to the next presenter. Um, to move through the particulars of the ordinance. And um, I will let that happen. <laughs> um, I think maybe we should just have everybody who's a part of uh, this presentation just do a quick introduction um, of themselves, if that's, if that's all right. Um, so just for example, Kate, uh, would you introduce yourself? Okay, I'm Kate Stevenson. I'm uh, one of the members of the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. Okay, and uh, Emmy, I know you're here. Hi, I'm Emmy Luck, and I am with Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships and the Energy and Climate Associate, who will be explaining a bit about the ordinance to you today. Okay, um, any other of the members of uh, the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership uh, or uh, or Veronique, would you like to introduce yourself? Go ahead, Carolyn. Oh, thanks, Mayor. And uh, this is Carolyn Sarnell Goldthwaite, and I'm also uh, with NEEP, and we've been providing technical support to the city. So, Veronique, pass it to you. Hi, I'm Veronique Vignon with uh, Clearly Energy, and we have been the technical partner on this project. Um, I think that is, like, I don't think, Lauren, I don't think you need to introduce yourself. Um, and I don't think I'm missing anyone, am I? Okay. All right, so I think we're up to Kate. Okay, great. Well, I just want to um, kick things off a little bit with a little bit of context around, um, you know, where this came from. This is a project we've been working on for a while, but it's, it's part of the city's larger net zero goal. So I just wanted to remind us all that Back in 2018, uh, well, starting in 2014, the city council adopted a net zero goal, and that was refined a few years ago in 2018 um, um, by setting a goal that by 2050, fossil fuel use will be eliminated entirely, and 100% of the energy needs of the city will be met renewably. And so, you know, this 
ordinance is a small piece of the puzzle, but it really helps us start to work towards the goal of um, kind of the larger community and how we're going to help all Montpelier residents and businesses um, eventually move towards net zero. So, you know, I just wanted to say we have made a lot of progress in this area, you know, over the last 10 years. Um, we specifically focusing on municipal operations, you know, we've been able to reduce energy use by 19% over that time and replace a large percentage of our energy with renewable sources. Um, so I'll be coming back to you, the council soon to tell you more about kind of the municipal side of things. But, um, but this is really about how do we, how do we um, continue that work in, in residences. And um, so some of the other things that the council has done is adopt this tax stabilization policy, um, supported the my ride um, for alternatives to single occupancy vehicles. Um, next slide, Cameron. Um, and it, the bigger context is, you know, overall, we have this um, commitment to the Paris Climate Agreement, um, and we all have to play a part in that. Um, this is just a slide from the Energy Action Network that talks about, you know, what's Next. what's Vermont's piece of that climate um, goal, and what are the different ways that we could re reach it, you know? And so this is just an example of, it's gonna be a combination of a lot of things, EVs, um, heat pumps, advanced wood, um, and renewable electricity. And so, you know, this really gets at retrofitting. How do we encourage residents to retrofit their homes in different ways? Next slide. Um, and, you know, if you think of Vermont as a total, um, Montpelier is about 1% of the population. So if you like, if you took all of the things that we need to do and, you know, kind of um, condense that down to what's our share, you know, we need to install 900 heat pump systems, for example, or 250 wood heating systems, we need to do 900 additional retrofits to meet to, to do our part to reach that Paris climate goal. So just want to throw that out there as the larger context, and then I will hand it back to Anne. Okay, uh, so yeah, go ahead with the next slide there. Uh, so uh, this particular uh, ordinance uh, has uh, a history starting back at least until 2018. Um, it, uh, actually, prior to 2018, there was some movement on this at the state level. Uh, but in 2018, the city of Montpelier uh, passed a, a charter amendment that gave authority for the city to do quite a, a, well, a few things. Um, and this particular uh, aspect of regulating uh, the uh, home energy labeling was uh, just actually the only part of that that passed um, in that next uh, spring during that uh, legislative uh, session. Uh, after that, we had uh, some meetings with real estate professionals as well as, uh, as a public hearing. Um, and th this was to uh, get feedback and uh, refine uh, what we were doing uh, based on that feedback. Uh, once we had a, a draft that uh, we felt, uh, the, the group that was working on this, the draft that we felt uh, worked, then we had that reviewed by the city's attorney. So that, that was done uh, last, last August. And so this uh, specifically uh, is the language that um, passed the legislature that gave us the authority to do this. Because um, that is, um, a, yeah, took a, a particular a charter amendment to um, be allowed to, to have this happen. Uh, so that's um, that part of it. Uh, one of the things that I found compelling about why we should be doing this is thinking about uh, gas mileage for a car. That is a critical piece of information that I think a lot of us look for when we uh, go to buy a car. And um, it is, I think it's really interesting that uh, the equivalent for a house has otherwise not existed. Um, and so this is, this is a, a way to actually to generate uh, a standardized um, apples to apples kind of comparison for homes like a, a gas mileage rating would be. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over, I think, to Emmy uh, to talk about some of the specifics. Yes, thank you, Mayor Watson, and thank you to the city council members for having us here tonight. So just to reduce the use of acronyms, I'll explain who, who we are a little bit again. So we are the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships, or NEEP. 
and we work with communities and states across the Northeast to reduce energy consumption and carbon emissions from the building sector in order to create healthier, more affordable, and sustainable places for people to live, work, and play. And we're here tonight because we've assisted with the creation of similar policies, and I've been working with Mayor Watson and Montpelier's Energy Efficiency Working Group on this effort for the last few years. So residential energy disclosure policies are picking up momentum across the country because of their proven ability to provide emissions reductions, occupant empowerment, and economic stimulation. As you can see, there are a variety of approaches to this, ranging from simple utility data disclosure to home energy labels. Portland, Oregon, Berkeley, Austin, and Minneapolis currently operate mandatory residential energy labeling policies like the one at the center of today's conversation. Next slide, please. So compared with volunteer, voluntary programs, mandatory programs offer much more equitable data accessibility and transparency, as well as significantly more impacts in terms of consumer action and resulting bill and emission savings. By mandating standard energy data disclosure, communities can better enable affordable energy resources and solutions for all residents. Providing relevant information increases clarity and transparency in the processes of financial and operational planning and purchasing for a home. It can also be instrumental in achieving a community's climate goals, as Kate mentioned earlier. Montpelier has already established that tackling climate change is in the best interest of its residents, businesses, and public service entities. As residential energy use is a leading contributor to Montpelier's greenhouse gas profile, engaging and empowering residents is an essential component of achieving Montpelier's net zero goal. Studies show that homes disclosing energy information sell on average faster and for more money than homes that don't disclose energy information at all regardless of home performance. Multiple studies also show that voluntary programs just don't achieve the intended goals in terms of cost or carbon savings. Mandatory programs that drive significant resident action stimulate the local economy by creating a more energy savvy population, strengthening home appraisals and valuations, supporting real estate transactions, and increasing the utilization of utility programs, product rebates, and contractor services. Next slide, please. So the Vermont Home Energy Profile, or VHEP, was developed as a more affordable and flexible alternative to traditional home energy audits. While there's absolutely a need and a place for in-person audits, many homeowners would benefit from an option that could provide custom recommendations without the time or cost burden of an on-site audit. With the statewide energy labeling working group and the Montpelier team, we evaluated the applicability of other program approaches used in other communities and assessed the needs of Vermont residents. In addition to this policy analysis, we listened to and incorporated feedback from residents and other impacted stakeholder groups, including real estate professionals, and worked to, to address concerns and to build consensus around our approach. After completing this extensive assessment a few years ago, the team opted for the custom VHEP tool for a few reasons. On-site audits were already difficult due to a small local certified auditor workforce and in-person visits have become even more complicated since the onset of the pandemic. Traditional offerings are also more costly and more time intensive for all involved. This tool streamlines the first few steps of understanding a home's energy performance and reduces the burden on both residents and city, city and state staff. VHEP is not intended to replace, but rather to complement in home audits. VHEP can serve as a first step for a resident embarking on their energy journey, or can be used to inform deep retrofit projects until an in-depth audit can be performed. And finally, thanks to Efficiency Vermont, the tool is currently free to use for all Montpelier residents. Next slide, please. Thank you. The Vermont Home Energy Profile was designed specifically for Vermont residents. We solicited and incorporated, incorporated public feedback throughout the process and tested the tool with a group of stakeholders ranging from ages 18 to 80. I actually created one with my parents for their house in Westover and we all found the tool to be easy and helpful. The VHEP uses publicly available information pulled from MEEP's Helix platform, 
along with an automated home energy modeling software by our partner, Clearly Energy. After using these components to generate an estimate, you can further refine your profile by adding information on things like appliance features and utility bills. I'll explain a bit more about how to create your profile later on. Next slide, please. While utility bill disclosures offer an idea of the home's energy needs, labels like VHEP offer custom recommendations based on the physical assets of a home, which are more helpful data points for potential new homeowners who may operate the house very differently than current homeowners. The VHEP provides tailored recommendations for improvement and encourages customers to utilize resources provided by organizations such as Efficiency Vermont. For this reason, labels are more often more effective for consumer engagement and empowerment than simple utility data disclosure. Now, Councillor Hurl will speak a bit more about the labeling benefits. Thank you, Emmy. Um, so I'm just going to walk through some of the potential benefits of this type of policy. And this is really looking at research and experience from other places who have already implemented similar policies. Uh, so for one, the research shows that between 12 and 37% of those who buy homes with energy labels make energy improvements to their homes that they were otherwise not planning to make. This is in contrast to the business as usual home energy improvement rate, which is around 1%. So we see this compelling evidence that having this type of information spurs investments in the kinds of energy improvements that we want to see in our community to meet our net zero target and which are also the types of investments that we know can save people money on their monthly energy bills and make homes healthier and more comfortable over the long term. Next slide. There's also a consumer protection component to this ordinance. This information can help people make better informed choices and better understand what they're getting into when they're buying a home. The tool provides an apples to apples comparison for homeowners so they can have a clear understanding of potential energy costs for a new home they're considering. Um, in particular, we know that low income households can have high energy burdens, uh, which is the percentage of income um, a family spends on energy bills. And this energy burden can be three times higher for low income households. So knowing potential energy costs upfront can be particularly important for lower income families so they can compare potential homes and plan for these expenses. Um, I know I've heard from several constituents about how after they bought a home here in Montpelier, they had much higher than expected energy costs, which were challenging to deal with. And if they'd known they could have planned better and it would have taken away um, some of that stress of this, these big unknown expenses popping up um, during their time of new home ownership. Next slide, please. Uh, providing this information at the time a home is listed for sale um, also allows the buyer to include this information as part of their negotiation with a bank or other mortgage provider and potentially including energy improvements in the cost of the mortgage um, or um, as a tool to receive a better rate. And you know, we know we have an old housing stock in Montpelier, so knowing what you're getting into and having information about improvements that are available that could be then rolled into your mortgage could be really helpful to home buyers. Um, I heard from some constituents who said they wished they had known this information because they later made home improvements that would have been easier and better to deal with as part of the purchase and mortgage negotiation process. Um, also, just noting that right now there are numerous incentives and with federal stimulus programs like we were hearing about earlier tonight, we anticipate even more opportunities for home buyers to get good deals on energy improvement um, projects. So knowing that information when you're in the process of buying a home um, and being able to, to look for and identify those opportunities could be really helpful to people. Next slide, please. Um, this ordinance would allow the city to see where there might be a need for financial support for homeowners to make energy improvements to their homes. I know I'm really interested in thinking about what programs we might provide as a city to help people make energy improvements, um, which again can help our community meet our net zero climate pollution goal, while also helping all families access programs that will help them have cleaner, more efficient, and more affordable homes. Uh, and having the kind of information we'll get with this um, through this ordinance will help the city and residents better understand which types of programs um, are most needed. Next slide. 
Uh, this ordinance would provide the city with information about how we can best achieve our net zero energy goals with respect to thermal energy use in buildings. We know home heating is a major driver of climate pollution in Vermont. So, you know, as we've been hearing about, if we're serious about meeting our commitment to our net zero goal and taking the steps needed to address the climate emergency that we all declared uh, in the last year or so, this kind of information and policy will be a really valuable tool in helping us get there. Uh, according to the Energy Action Network, uh, which is a uh, kind of think tank based here in Montpelier, since Vermont imports 100% of the fossil fuels we use, the vast majority of that money, um, up to 80 cents of every dollar we spend on fossil fuels leaves the state. And in contrast, um, efficient and renewable energy alternatives keep a much higher share of our energy dollars recirculating, um, helping employ our neighbors and improving our local economy. And for Vermonters who make investments in efficiency and renewable energy, there are numerous analyses showing that people save money over the long run. I will now pass it back over to Emmy. Thank you, Councillor. As I mentioned earlier, this whole process entails five easy steps and takes about 10 to 20 minutes, depending on how much you'd like to edit. Once you visit this website and create a login, you can claim your home by checking a box to confirm that you are the property owner or an authorized professional working on behalf of the owner. At this step, you can also lock your home to disallow edits from any other parties. Next, you'll review the estimated profile where you can further refine your results by adding additional information on your home's energy features. Then you are ready to generate a profile. If you make any significant energy upgrades later on, you can always create a new profile to see how those changes impact your home's energy performance. Next slide, please. The Home Energy Guide, which will be available to all residents, gives step-by-step -step instructions for creating a profile with details on what each step means, screenshots of the tool and process, and tips for filling it out. It also includes some frequently asked questions and answers, some of which we'll cover on the next two slides. And can we bring up all of the questions, please? Thank you. So to recap, your data will only be shared with the state and city agencies and partners as authorized for the purposes of maintaining this program. Your data will never be sold. And as I said earlier, homes with energy labels typically sell for slightly higher and slightly faster than non-labeled homes. If you don't have access to a computer, someone from the city can assist you in creating a label. This ordinance will apply to all homes for sale in Montpelier, including those for sale by owner. If a buyer finds that the information on the label was misrepresented, they may take legal action against the seller. And there are a few more questions to review on the next slide. Can we bring those up? Thank you. Currently, thanks to Efficiency Vermont, Generating a VHEP profile is free, although there may be a minor administrative cost to use it in a listing. Depending on how much information you decide to add, creating a profile takes about 10 to 20 minutes using publicly available property information and the data that you enter along with an algorithm. Finally, the estimated costs on your profile might not reflect your actual energy costs, because the VHEP algorithm normalizes these costs based on variations in occupancy and weather. There are more frequently asked questions and answers in the Home Energy Guide, and we always welcome any additional questions and feedback. Now I will pass it to Donna to talk about compliance. Thank you all again for your careful consideration of this important topic. All right, so <clears throat> enforcement um, has these three parts to it. Um, we'll be regularly checking published listings to make sure that um, they are correct and adhered to. Um, we are expecting that we will receive some complaints. That always happens. I'm hopeful that um, with some um, additional planned um, awareness generation um, once the ordinance is adopted that will reduce those potential complaints that are coming from misunderstandings. Um, then um, the, the um, signature um, on the document 
testifying that the seller provided the VHEP to the buyer is filed with the city clerk. And those records are available for um, inspection at any given time. And there'll be um, a check on whether or not that has happened. We'll follow that um, through that at the end of that filing. Um, so it's pretty simple, um, but um, easily implementable um, and um, able to be validated and resolved um, at any step in those three uh, different areas. And I was going to jump in here just to uh, mention with that third option, uh, filing with the city clerk costs $15 per page. Uh, so if we were to require the um, profile, uh, which is double sided, uh, plus a document testifying to that, uh, that this uh, document was uh, provided to the uh, buyer, uh, that that would be a third page. So it could be $45, but I, I think we as a energy efficiency working group, we're going to recommend uh, if we leave that option in as a council that uh, we simply go with uh, just the um, not, uh, not including the profile, but just including that uh, uh, verification that it was provided to the, the seller. So, um, so just $15 there. And I think it's back to you, Donna, with um, uh, next steps. Okay. Um, so our potential next steps are identified here. Um, we're going to communicate information. We'll send um, that information through water and sewer bills um, that go out on a regular schedule. We'll also be doing a fair amount of social media, as I mentioned before. We'll answer calls. Um, we're going to see if, um, and this is just under discussion right now, but we're going to see if we can create a portion of Public Works page to um, sort of archive question and answers so that we don't get, so that people can look at that site and maybe get the answer before they um, respond in another way. Um, the, web, the webcast will be created. Um, we're, as you can see, informational se sessions will be provided. Um, and then we're hopeful that if the, all of this works out, for the next um, conversation that the ordinance will take effect at the turn of the fiscal year for the city. All right, and just to uh, close this out here, so uh, this does uh, affect uh, different groups within the city, uh, potential home buyers, sellers, uh, and current com uh, homeowners. Uh, so for potential buyers, uh, we're hoping that it leads to an uh, increased uh, in energy investments in their homes. Uh, for sellers, uh, particularly for um, those who have made energy improvements, it's a way to honor those improvements that they have made that might otherwise be uh, invisible to a potential buyer. And uh, for current homeowners, it's uh, a way to see what they might do to uh, increase the energy efficiency of their home and, and find cost savings. Um, so I think this is going to be a useful tool for uh, Montpelier uh, and for all the, these different groups. Um, so at this point, uh, any, any further comments from uh, the presenters? Anything that we missed? Anything you want to fill in? I would just jump in here and say that it's um, it's very interesting to me that um, after the long time it took for the work to be pulled together and for us to feel comfortable um, with this presentation and the recommendations that we are within two weeks of Earth Day and this um, upcoming Earth Day starts this it is the 51st um, celebration of Earth Day. Um, and it went from a very, very small suggestion um, to a global um, celebration of taking care of the Earth 
And so um, coincidence, I don't know if you believe in coincidences, but I think they always have meaning. And so I'm pretty um, happy and excited for the city that this work has culminated in this time period. Um, and um, hopefully uh, the work that we've done on this um, particular ordinance um, will last at least as long as Earth Day has lasted to date. Great, thank you. And I think Cameron, you can probably stop uh, sharing uh, your screen there. Um, okay, any other of the presenters have anything they want to um, say or fill in? Okay. All right. So this is a, a time for the council to ask um, clarifying questions. Um, what logistics or specifics can we can we clarify for you? Uh, go ahead, Dan. Thanks. Um, I have. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll focus really on some of the questions that I have. Um, and I'll just throw them out there and understanding that with the multi presenter format, there may be one or more of you who are best suited to answer these questions. Um, starting and they're both, I think, broader questions as well as more Picayune uh, questions of the details. Uh, so the first question is the data that is collected. I think Emmy indicated that it was going to be available only, well, it wouldn't be sold but would be available to state or city agencies. Is that correct? Which? Yeah, I, I can provide a high level answer on that. And then if Carolyn or Veronique want to jump in, feel free. But um, the data that will be reported through the tool will be stored in NEEPS Helix platform, which the city and the state will use to manage their their compliance of the, the program. And um, beyond that, it should not go outside of Helix, but Carolyn, correct me if I am wrong. Hi, thanks for the question. Um, Emmy, you got that right. So it's the tool that was created is being used here for Montpelier, but then also voluntarily on a statewide basis. So that's just the differenti uh, differentiator why Emmy said statewide. Efficiency Vermont, Burlington Electric is supporting a statewide voluntary tool as part of the statewide plan, but specifically for, for Montpelier, the data is just really for the mayor, the team, for all of you to be able to manage um, the compliance period and who has uploaded their VHEMP. So it's it, that data is just for Montpelier. Well, but uh, I guess the question I have as, as a follow-up is, um, is there anything that exempts this from public records requests? I would defer that back to Mayor Watson, but it, it should not in that this is um, for, for homeowners disclosing their energy usage. But do you mean in, in terms of disclosing like all the public data that's in there? Well, I mean, if we if the city has access to it and it's available to the city as well as the state, um, that becomes, at least in my understanding of public records law, becomes a, a public document and potentially is uh, something that if a public records request is filed, that data could would have to be disclosed unless there is an exemption to it or unless some misunderstanding whether it's not a, a public record. Um, so um, we can uh, check with this uh, with our lawyer. Uh, however, I would say that if we don't generate uh, the document, like if we don't if we don't have the document, um, then that's not something that we um, that I think would be uh, right. discoverable. But I'm I'm not a lawyer, so we should we should look into that. I, I mean, it's just uh, even if we don't generate the, the record if we have access to it or we access it and have a copy, it now is a public record. Um, you know, this happens all the time with private entities, you know, where they have to disclose their records or, you know, the state has access to them and, and they become a public record. And I guess my concern is just um, understanding um, you know, whether, you know, one of the things that's being touted about this is that these records aren't available. 
to private entities to harvest. Um, but if there's a workaround with the public records law, that would certainly be good to know. Second question, um, what happens if you're locked out of your profile? Um, so you go to create it and somebody else has claimed it. I feel like that's a very neat question. Or Carolyn. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say, I can answer Veronique. Did you wanna jump in? Um, sure, hi, this is Veronique with Clearly Energy. Um, there, um, so there is on each profile page a contact form with our contact information. Um, with what you're saying, with, with, with this in mind, we'll, we'll put kind of that contact form earlier on in the process in the event that somebody needs to reach out to us to, to unlock a specific profile. Um, if the request came in, we would obviously kind of circle up with the, you know, the person that, that currently holds the profile um, to make sure that we're not, you know, that, that, we're, that we're doing the right thing. But behind the scenes, there is a process to, to unlock a record that, that has been claimed. Okay. I mean, you know, my concern would be sort of threefold. I mean, obviously, if a prior owner claims a, uh, an account and then the property is sold, within a relatively short period of time, that old claim may be still there. Mm -hmm. um, or if the couple parties that own it are in a dispute, whether they're married or just happen to be co-owners that no longer get along and talk to each other, and one side claims that. Um, or three, you know, you could see the, uh, the, the malicious actor who comes in and claims that. And, um, you know, given that this ordinance is making is going to become a critical part of how property is transferred. Um, and, it, and the fact that the owner may be subjected to liability if they can't do the disclosure. It, it, I, I'd like to sort of fully understand how that would sort of be rectified or fixed. Let me pass on to the third question because I've got a bunch. Um, how much testing has been done uh, of this form? Um, in taking either, um, you know, uh, actual properties and, and plugging in sort of the generic uh, non-owner verified information and then comparing it with the actual usage. Is this, what's the sort of level of testing? Uh, maybe I'll start just on the technical testing and then we'll let the, the NEEP and, and Montpelier folks talk about kind of the testing within the, the Montpelier population. The process started with um, Efficiency Vermont and Vermont Energy Investment Corporation taking all of the information which they had from in-person audits and comparing them from results with generated with this tool. So they produced kind of as comprehensive an analysis of the, the estimates so generated cool. by the tool relative cool. to um, relative to kind of the in-depth, you know, the in-depth audit, as well as with about 25. So they had about 100 homes. Good, you're asking good questions. With, um, with in-person audits and about 25 homes with um, utility bill data. So from sort of an analysis standpoint, um, that was the first step in the process. And so I'll pass it on to um, someone from NEEP or Montpelier to talk about the, the, the local testing. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, thanks, Veronique, for that part is that so what we have done is worked within the committee and also worked with other project partners like VPARC to do some different testing and outreach to local residents. And that's the stat that Emmy had provided that we did do an email um, to residents about eight months or so ago is through part of the development process where we had uh, 12 Vermont residents age, ranging in age from 18 to 75, 80, that we basically did a focus group. We sat with them, timed them, asked questions while they could actually go through the tool. In addition, other members of the committee have also things of the tool to make sure that does it work? Does it resonate? And even up until this week, we were getting some uh, feedback from stakeholders that we were making some slight tweaks to and adding to the FAQ. So it's it's gone through about two years of different iterations and stakeholder feedback. And I don't know if um, Mayor Watson um, or others of the committee want to chime in on their experience with it and other outreach. Um, no, I think that's that's a good summary. 
So uh, the next question I have, and, and I'm, I'm sort of going through the questions of and reserving any comment or feedback off of this. I don't, I don't know if it's necessarily, I don't want to dominate, um, although I do have a lot of questions. Um, the algorithm that the information gets put through, is that a proprietary algorithm? Uh, or is there any way for somebody to find out, you know, sort of open up the black box of it? Um, that is very, uh, clearly energy's proprietary tool, the algorithm that was created. Okay. Yeah. Um, and is that, as you indicated before, that's an algorithm that you will continue to tweak and change? over time as you get feedback? Yes, both. Um, so the, the the tool itself, if you want, is benchmarked against a national data set of, um, of home energy consumption that is publicly available. Sure. It shares a number of features with um, an algorithm that would be used with an in-person audit. Um, it makes some simplifications in, in some areas. Um, and yes, um, you know, it's, it's always open to feedback. I think my favorite part of the feedback from the first round of testing is that we absolutely needed to add a, a beverage refrigerator to, um, <laughs> to, to, to the list of home features. Um, and so, you know, there right now we sort of have, um, you know, we compile feed, we compile requests for, for improvements and modifications and then run them through the um, Vermont wide um, labeling group um, for prioritization and kind of what, you know, what is kind of seems to be the, the things that, that need, um, that, that need tweaking. Okay. So um, how much over time has that algorithm changed in these two years? I mean, have you, is it, is it putting out uh, significantly different numbers than what it was at the beginning of the two year period or? So it's, um, it uses utility rates. Um, so the number that you will get, you know, that you got maybe a year ago is not necessarily the same number that you will get this year because the, um, the electric utility rates evolve, the natural gas utility rates evolve, as do the underlying fuels. So there's never, it, there's no expectations of a steady state across time. Um, the big changes that were made to the algorithm or the ability for people to put in their utility bills and to essentially rescale whatever the algorithm had initially generated to match those, those utility bills. Now, the utility bills themselves, as Emmy mentioned, are adjusted to reflect a home under standard conditions, which means that um, they're adjusted for the weather conditions for the period of the utility bills. They're adjusted for occupancy. Um, if you have five people in a home, we're assuming that you're, for example, consuming more water, then a home would at standard occupancy of, of three people. And standard occupancy it depends on the size of the home. Um, and they're also adjusted for the thermostat settings in the home, meaning that if you like to keep your home at 82 degrees in the winter, standard thermostat settings are, that's probably pretty high, but say you know, 75 degrees in the winter, standard thermostat settings um, from the NASH from, from federal documents is, I forget if it's 70 or, or 68. Um, so everything is kind of brought back. Those adjustments are typically not huge. Um, they're generally 10 to 20 percent um, or less. But so the, the big kind of adjustment to the algorithm that was done um, from feedback with stakeholders, um, particularly stakeholders from the real estate community, was that we needed this ability to sort of take real world utility bill data and adjust things accordingly. Also just want to note too that some of the other stakeholder feedback we got was just on the ease and use of the tool. So the language that we use. So there's a piece of it that's the technical side of the algorithm. And the other was just placement of but buttons, question we asked. Um, so that was some of the other general uh, updates that we made through several iterations and feedback that we had, including from the real estate industry. Multiple um, uh, heating systems within a home, the be the beverage fridge that Veronique mentioned. So there were a lot of there were other additional questions and some smaller uh, modifications that we had also made. 
So my follow-up question to that is, and I'm trying to understand, I've gone through these documents. If um, if you go to the, the energy profile and you plug in your actual data, how does that change the standard output that you get from this, uh, this process? So if you are a, if your home is occupied by the reference number of people and your thermostat settings are standardized thermostat settings um, and your weather period is pretty normal, then your utility bill um, will be the total number um, reflected on the profile. Um, but because of the three categories of adjustments that we made, that we make the utility bills, the, the number that you see on the profile relative to the utility bill can change by 10 to 20% or so. But the utility bills trump the original kind of estimate that's generated from public information. Okay. So, and I understand on the on the printout you get it. It does have that sort of utility bill. So if I if I plug in and I say I spent two thousand on on electricity and three thousand on oil, that's what's going to say uh, on my output. But um, does that change any of the other standardization or any any of the other data that gets put into that document? Um, so, like for example, it talks about like the MMBTU at the top or puts me along that uh, that little wedge uh, of uh, of green to redness mm -hmm. um, does that is that affected by entering that individual data with the, with the bills yes so what happens if uh, a, a resident or an owner puts in this information kicks out and they think it's wrong um, what, what's the, the sort of um, remedy or uh, appeal process? If the buyer thinks it's wrong or if the person- or the, the seller, the seller gets this, this disclosure and, and, and says, this, this doesn't look accurate for, for whatever reason. If maybe, um, you know, uh, they, they list it as less efficient for some reason, or they seek to challenge any of the data because it's obviously all it's not just what they've inputted, it's then tweaked through your algorithm. Um, and for some reason, they think it's it's inaccurate. So I, I'll, I'll just answer kind of the, there there should be a simple way for them to, you know, reach out and, and state their disagreement. I think I'll refer then back to the city as to how they city would want to resolve this, the, the, this, this situation. In general, um, if utility bills are entered, the adjustments that are made are not, are, you know, are, are not substantial. They're, as I said, in, in the 10 to 20% range. Um, but yeah. I'll defer to the city as to how, as to sort of what is the process for challenging the estimate and, um, you know, and if there's a process for actually listing directly the utility, sort of the unadjusted utility bills. I mean, I think that is, that's certainly already um, an available option to, uh, to homeowners. Right, but it, I'm, I'm just thinking, um, so, and I think you've answered the question, which is, you know, basically there isn't, uh, you know, they can provide more information to the buyer, but there, there wouldn't be a, a way for them to contact you, for example, or whoever's administering this and saying, I don't know what algorithm you're using, but I think this is inaccurate. Even after I've entered my data, um, this uh, I don't agree with this. What's put out from from this report? Um, there know. absolutely is a way to contact to contact us. There, there's okay. a there's a contact box on you know on on the page on the the, the data entry page, um, and people are are welcome to 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 use it. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just use an analogy um, because it's it's similar. You know, you you take those DNA tests, and um, they have algorithms to determine your your uh, ethnic origins based on the DNA, and they used to be wildly divergent. And so, uh, I'm thinking if if you know just based on algorithms, um, if you plug in some of this data, um, 
and and you come to believe that you know for whatever reason um, this is this algorithm maybe is making a generalization about your particular house that isn't doesn't hold as far as fuel efficiency maybe it portrays it as more efficient than it actually is um, you know and I'm thinking of old houses in Vermont where you may have done some weatherization to part of it but not another part of it and so you want to correct it to make sure that it doesn't overstate your case. Um, I'm just trying to understand how that would necessarily be um, uh, done. I think it's. I think it's also important to recognize that uh, that this is not uh, providing an exact estimate of. Uh, it's not a prediction of what uh, homeowners' bills will be the next year. It's a standardized. Uh, way to look at homes. So it's just providing an apples to apples uh, kind of comparison. And if, uh, you know, after we've uh, explained um, what the, uh, the out, like what the algorithm takes into account and how, uh, how that uh, is generally uh, generated, I mean, that if there is still a discrepancy that might turn into a suggestion for a, 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 for a tweak, you know, if there's a reason um, beyond uh, what has been imagined, uh, then, then uh, you know, as clearly energy as Veronique has said, uh, they're still open to to that feedback. Um, but uh, but for now, I think it's just it's important that people understand what uh, the the purpose of it is and where it comes from. And the other thing too to remember is that uh, that this algorithm has been tested against national uh, data uh, for uh, actual uh, energy uh, usage and and uh, and, and audits. Um, so I hope that's that's helpful. Any other? Yeah, keep if you've got more, carry on. Just, just a couple more, and appreciate your patience with this. Um, so uh, Donna, um, you were talking about enforcement. Um, who and is there a position that's going to be dedicated in DPW to doing this enforcement component? <clears throat> we will identify someone. I haven't gone down that road yet. Um, to determine who that would be. And, and how much time do you estimate per week this person would have to dedicate to this enforcement? I haven't had that conversation with um, the team yet. I'm hoping not a significant amount, um, but that is, ha we, haven't, we haven't had a robust discussion about that. Um, Thanks. And the last question, and then I'll, I'll give other people a chance, um, and, and is um, uh, maybe for John Odom, as far as recording, if, if John's listening, um, is this something where the price of recording could change uh, depending on how it's recorded, whether it's recorded directly in the land records or just simply recorded within your office? Um, I'm thinking, uh, you know, this, this almost seems like something that wouldn't necessarily have to be in the actual physical land records, but could be kept as a record within your office separate, and whether that would reduce the, the cost of recording it. Yeah, I mean, the $15 is just, you know, what's set by the state for recording anything in the land records. You know, I think if someone's going to you know, do that kind of research, they're probably going to prefer to have it all in one spot and it sort of makes a certain amount of sense to have it there but you know everything else is you know it's up for any kind of discussion okay thanks i appreciate that and appreciate the opportunity to ask those questions so uh cede the floor to others other questions from the council uh donna go ahead well i'm just going to use my own little condo in filling out the form there are a lot of weird things going on here. So back to Dan's question, do I call someone and say, oh, this doesn't fit. And then I put in what I pay for electricity, but I have a community net solar. So I don't pay a regular electrical bill. So there are exceptions. And where do we go to cover those exceptions? Anybody? So, yeah, so I mean, at this point there is, so, so there is a contact form, um, you know, somebody in this group just sent an inquiry during the time of this meeting and, you know, I and, and several others have received it. <laughs> um, 
um, and, and will answer. Um, I, I, yes, there, there are exceptions. Um, we're trying to sort of toe the line between something that is, you know, that doesn't get too down into the, 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 the details, um, to, um, you know, to, to trip up people. I, I clearly, I understand. I think there's, there's already been a request from somebody in town to ask whether they could put, um, quantities consumed as opposed to dollar amounts, which would then allow us to use the standardized right. um, utility rates as opposed to the customized utility rate that we that we have. So that request has now already kind of been submitted back to the statewide working group um, to take up. You know, this is not sort of, it's not, we're not trying to be over formal about it. I'm just trying to sort of balance out city goals with um, the, you know, the reason why the initial focus was on dollar utility amounts and not quantities is that a lot of people will get tripped up by quantities. Um, well, and, and I guess I was trying to find out if there was a way to get somebody on the phone while I'm doing it. Because like one of the weird things that happened because I'm in a condominium building, mm -hmm. but I'm dealing with my unit mm -hmm. is that I put a number in and then it, takes it and divides I'm like I only have spent like a thousand dollars a year on all of my electricity for everything but it's applying like 300 for heat and 600 for lights and I'm scratching my head <laughs> the way it divides it the way it decides to divide what I'm paying out in electricity so I was just like gee if I could have somebody on the phone with me um, then I feel better of saving that data but if I can't, then I just save it. I talk to somebody and then I go back and correct it. Right. Um, that's that's a fair question. I mean, I think, you know, we've, we've talked about ideas about scheduling a consultation. Generally, it, it doesn't, we've realized it does not take very long to get people going. And, and even though there may be initial, like, what am I looking at? Um, once people get over that, it's, 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 it's actually, pretty straightforward. You start editing a few things and you look at how things adjust. And um, so, you know, I'm, I'm quite open to have kind of a, a scheduling tool to schedule a consultation if, if that kind of helps the process roll out more smoothly um, in the beginning, because the experience has been that it really does not take people very long to, to, to get going. Yeah, we we had also discussed as a group, and Mayor Watson certainly chime in that uh, once passed, um, that there would be somebody on the city side that could help people walk through this process if a homeowner needed assistance. But on the technical side, NEEP or Clearly Energy is certainly available to help folks. As Veronique said, if you fill out that contact button, we can set up a time to walk through with folks on how to use it. We're developing other tutorials videos um, to help with the onboarding. But sometimes, like as you pointed out, you might have a anomaly in the system. We need to then address that or figure out why that is. And you want to talk to a live person. So we're, we're more than happy to kind of work with people through that process. That's really good to know. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I mean, if we take a little step back, I think, you know, the the result of this process is we have put more responsibility on the, the individual and the homeowner as opposed to other people in, 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 in the, in the real estate chain. Um, and so we're cognizant that this puts more responsibility on, on the individuals. And I think there's, there's a number of people between NEEP, ourselves, the city that, that are very willing and, re and ready to help. Um, but the benefit of this approach is that it's very cost effective. It has no delays really in, 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 in you know, in, in the transaction of the house or, or, or any of that. So, so there are kind of a number of benefits with, with the approach. And people often get to know their home better and figure out how to manage their own home, even if they're not looking to sell. It is, it's much more educational to do something like this yourself than to bring in someone, someone else to do it for you. Any other clarifying questions? Uh, Jack, go ahead. I uh, thank you for this. I'm, I'm speaking as someone who voted in favor of the uh, of the charter amendment and who supports this idea. And I do have some questions. Some of them are follow up on follows up follow ups on what Dan said. Um, one uh, question related to recording of the 
uh, of the report, it sounds as though the uh, proposed ordinance requires the uh, the seller to s certify that the Vermont Home Energy profile was delivered to the buyer, and then after the sell after the sale. Uh, provide a copy of the certification and the report or the profile to the city clerk. And um, I wonder if there's, if it's necessary for the city clerk to have that, re, uh, that profile or if the, uh, the purpose would be served by simply requiring the certification to be uh, to be filed with the with the land records, that would one cut it from down from three pages to one page probably, and two address the uh, privacy concerns that Dan had because if that uh, profile is never within the uh, possession of the city government, then it, I would think it would not be a public record that. Uh, someone would have access to. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the other thought I, is that I've gotten some questions from constituents or at least one constituent about, uh, about this being a punitive thing, how we're charging people for, uh, for not delivering this profile uh, when they start listing the property and we're going to be requiring a, a city employee to uh, to pursue enforcement when if it's if it's not done, and I wonder if the uh, if the people who worked uh, on this have thought about looking at enforcement from another angle and saying. We're not we're not going to charge a fine. We're not going to chase you, but we will say to the cl town clerk that you are not allowed to record a deed unless you also unless it's accompanied by the certification that this uh, energy profile uh, has been delivered, and that that might be worse because uh, it would. Uh, it would hold up a lot of closings, which, uh, <clears throat> which you know, I'm not in the real estate. Real estate has never been part of the uh, area of law that I practice in, but I could see that could could create problems. Um, I see Don, Dan nodding his head as he as I'm talking. Um, in another question related to the. Uh, to the real estate transaction is uh, is what are the implications of uh, of any con contractual relate rights between the buyer and the seller based on the representations made in the uh, in the energy profile? Would there ever be a, a circumstance where the buyer would be able to go back on the seller and say, you provided me this, this profile. This was a, a representation by you of the condition of the premises. Um, it turns out to be something different. So you're liable to me for, for that misrepresentation. And is, is that a possible, possible risk? And if it is, how do we deal with it? Um, and I think those are the questions that I have right now. Oh yes, I should also say I'm I'm the person in this meeting who uh, who posted a, a question to the uh, to the website while while we've been talking, because one of the pe speakers said, well, once you've created a profile for your property you have the ability to lock that profile so no one else can claim and, and change it. And I was on the page and I didn't, 
because I created a profile for my own house, as probably most of us did, and I didn't see a place uh, or a mechanism to lock the profile that I created. So I, I'm sure I'm going to get uh, an answer back to that question. Um, yeah, well, I think I can speak to at least a couple of uh, the things that you asked about. Uh, I think we would probably not want to go with um, holding up uh, the transfer of a deed. Um, <laughs> we did talk about that as a as a group, and we we're particularly intending to not um, hold up any transfers um, as a result of this. Um, so that's that's one thing. Uh, I, I, speaking uh, not on behalf of the committee, but just in terms of um, your thought about uh, recording the report. Um, or sorry, just, uh, or I should say, not not including the, the profile in the records um, for the city. I think, uh, I, I think that actually makes some sense. Um, and in terms of the possibility of a misrepresentation uh, of the buyer to the, or I'm sorry, of the seller to the buyer, um, that is certainly possible. And, uh, but I think it is, it, it would also be, it would have to be very wrong. Um, because there would be many, many ways to end up with roughly the same number. Um, and so we, as a, as a group, assumed that there would be um, that the, the same avenues <clears throat> that a uh, buyer would have uh, in terms of, of uh, other kinds of misrepresentations would uh, apply to this one as well. Um, and then um, I'm sure someone will get back to you about the locking of the profile. So hopefully that is, is helpful. Um, other, yeah, no problem. Other questions? Maybe do, should I just, I, if I can just circle back on, on the last point and then I'll answer the, the locking bit. Um, so uh, on sort of the, the liability question, right? Any seller that is really genuinely concerned about that can, tally up their utility bills, enter that information, that total is represented verbatim on the profile. Um, so at that point, I think that they have their documentation to back up um, what is on the profile. And so then, yes, there can be a disagreement about how we adjust, how the algorithm adjusted the utility total, but I think they're in relatively, um, you know, and again, I'm not a lawyer, but it, at least the, you know that number can then be backed up on on their end, um, and and I think provide them a fair bit of comfort. Um, and then on the locking bit, um, when you initially claim the home, there are two check boxes. The first asks to certify or to the you know ask you to say that you are the homeowner or are allowed to um, act on behalf of the homeowner. The second checkbox is the lock, um, and it's a 30-day lock um, that prevents others from, from accessing it. So you may have skipped it, noticed it. There is another way to do it kind of at any point after the fact, um, and I can share that separately. Thanks. Any other clarifying questions? Uh, Connor, go ahead. Not a question, but I, I, I got a few questions on this, Mayor, and you pointed me in the right direction. Um, a couple of people had asked, you know, what if this $25 a day fine, like, keeps adding up and keeps adding up? Would you be on the hook for thousands of dollars? Uh, and you, you did point me to Section 1-9 of our ordinances, uh, which do cap it at $500, which may be at the risk of being duplicative, may be worth repeating in this ordinance, but Definitely, I, I think it's worth saying just for the uh, the audience we have today here. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Sure. I, I actually want to res respond to that exact point, and I think I think the ordinance does need to be changed because if you look at one dash oh nine, it talks about each day being a new violation, and each day's violation can go up to five hundred. So there's really no cap on the number of days that there's non-compliance. So if somebody fails to do this and they're seen as non-compliant from day one to day a thousand, you know, they may only be fined $25, but that 500 cap won't kick in, even though that $25 will add up over the thousand. So, I mean, I think if we want to put a cap on this, we're going to have to change that ordinance to, to insert that cap language to 500 cumulatively um, because of the 1-09. Um, 
So that's that's something that we had talked about with our lawyer, but that is a fine thing to do. We can do that. The other the uh, the other question I had, um, I just want to make sure. I, you know, I was looking again at, at at my profile that I that I did, and it just trying to understand the the data that comes out of this, and this may be helpful. Is that you know we talk about the uh, the so there's when I'm looking at it, and I want to make sure I'm I'm capturing all all of the data because we're starting to talk about things like liability. But I, I see that it has the home's expected annual energy cost is one thing. And obviously that would either be based on a standard number if there's no individual data input, or it would be based on the actual data that you input for your cost, your oil, electric, uh, gas. And then um, that's broken down in the second section into electric and heating oil and based off of kilowatt hours and, and prices. Um, and that would obviously be all based on actual data if you've inputted it, as opposed to um, the, the sort of standardized numbers, making sure I'm correct so far. Um, and then what seems to really be generated by, by this is the, and the sort of standardization would be the home's usage, um, expected annual energy usage um, but what, you know, and it, and it, is it the, is it, is what the algorithm really putting out that place on that wedge, um, where, where, where a particular home is located, um, or is there a piece of data that it's kicking out, um, be, beyond that, that I'm, I'm missing? So there, there are two scenarios to consider. Um, the first scenario is that somebody comes in, looks at the estimate, um, and says, that looks about right. Um, I have an Energy Star refrigerator. I'm going to check that off. Um, I've changed my light bulbs. And they purely change the, the home features side of things, never touching the utility bill totals because the total um, looks OK to them. So in that case, the cost is purely generated from an algorithm. Um, and the total cost really is the, product, is the product of the consumption broken down into the individual fuels and categories, so electricity, and then one or multiple fuels, depending on the home, um, and the um, utility rates and the fuel rates. And obviously, in particular for fuel, Everybody will pr procure fuel at different rates. We use, um, you know, an average over the past several months. So, you know, there's going to be some some slight discrepancies that that come in there. But so, case number one is somebody, you know, does not enter utility bill data. The cost and consumption are driven by the algorithm. The second case is somebody goes in and they can still you know, add their home energy features, but also puts in their utility bill total, in which case that is the driving factor of the overall cost. And then the consumptions are rescaled, if you want, by taking, by then by dividing by the utility rates that we, that we use to make, to, um, to match the utility. So if, if, if you tell us that you have, you know, a thousand dollar heating oil bill, and we're assuming $2.50 a gallon, then from there we can calculate that your consumption was 200 gallons, right? If not my mouth, 400 gallons, <laughs> whatever, the thousand divided by 250. Um, and so, um, so the consumptions are then derived from that. Um, does that help explain the, and then, you know, I, I know that on the wedge, the unit of measure is, uh, million British thermal units, which is not a unit of measure that's intuitive to the average homeowner, um, but it's a common unit of measure that we can use across all of the um, utility, all of the fuel electricity categories. So it allows us to compare the utility consumption to say the heating oil or propane or natural gas. So that's why that, that place on the wedge is in um, BTUs 
um, as a unit. And the design of the profile was really something that was spearheaded by um, by the folks at at, um, at Vermont at Efficiency Vermont and Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. Thank you. All right. I'm hoping that we can get to some public comment. Was there been a a lot of folks uh, who have been doing a great job hanging in there um, who I think probably want to comment on this. Uh, so just, just to be clear, is there any um, other counselors that have any clarifying questions at this point? Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to make a list of folks who would like to comment on this. Um, and you can raise your hand in the, in the raise uh, hand function. Uh, Steve, Steve Whitaker, verbal. Okay. Um, yeah, so if you uh, want to know how to raise your hand, at the bottom of your screen on your Zoom, there should be a reactions button. Hit that and it'll say raise hand. And um, if you're on a phone, feel free to mute yourself and let us know um, that you would like to speak. If you raise your hand, it does fit you into a queue. Okay. So um, I'm going to start with uh, just the hands that I see uh, raised here. So we're going to go uh, Peter Kelman and then Dan Jones, then Martha Nolan, Lori Holt, and then uh, Corby Griffin. So go ahead, Peter. Okay, thanks. Peter Kelman, I live in uh, District 3. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot. I'm just going to make a list. It's going to be a quicker version of Dan's who raised quite a few of the questions that I had. Uh, but I just want to say at the outset, I'm very much in favor of the goals of this uh, ordinance. I have severe doubts about the details. Um, and I'd like just, I'm just going to name some topics. Unintended outcomes, without going into them right now. Number two, algorithms are notorious for having hidden biases. I'm 77 years old. I don't have a long range view. Number three, Emmy's parents, fine, but the numbers that were tested and what they were tested against don't impress me. Number four, we need to look at some real incentives. What are the positive? What this is a little, little stick. Where are the carrots? We need to be thinking about some of the things that uh, Peter Welsh was talking about. How to underwrite the improvement, the energy improvements, how to reward them. Number five, hidden costs and hidden benefits. Uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but my fuel bills don't necessarily fall into the 12 month period. And if I go away for a month, things change. And if I have somebody who is taking care of my house, anyway, there's a lot of, there, there are more anomalies than standards, I believe. Um, and where, do, where does heating with wood come in? Where does buying bags of pellets come in? Where does the fact that I pay in advance for my propane and I get a discount? Where does the maintenance fees that I pay for my various fuel, fuel uh, consuming come in? And finally, um, you know, in the real estate, well, some of the real estate people will probably talk about SPIR, you know, vo voluntary descriptions of your home when you're selling it, in which a lot of this information is put in there. Well, people are going to tell the truth or people are going to lie on that just as much as on this. Coming up with a single number is, is kind of disturbing. It's, it, it lacks nuance. It lacks, you know, paying attention to all of these in individual differences. So I, I really am concerned about this particular algorithm-driven instrument, which is so easy to do. I looked at it. I didn't find it that easy to do. But anyway, so easy to do. How could something that is so easy to do yield something that is really valid? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um... So we're going to just hear from everybody, and I, I'm sure some of the folks um, from the group will want to respond to some of those things. Um, but let's uh, let's hold off for now and uh, just hear from everybody. Uh, Dan Jones, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, 
Unlike uh, others, I think you've uh, made a great start with this, um, having been involved with the Net Zero thing for the past six years. Uh, I am amazed at the amount of detail that goes into each of these decisions. Um, I guess I would rather say uh, that this is a great start and that what we have to get to the point of is saying, okay, there may be points at which things break down and we have to modify them, that rather than trying to keep back from the point where everything has to be perfect to start with, I think you've made a really great beginning. And I would hope that uh, the council can go forward with that, with the idea that perhaps in the future, there's going to have to be modifications. And we will find those modifications from experience, not from the complaints uh, right at the beginning. So uh, congratulations on getting it this far. I hope it goes forward. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Martha Nolan. Yes, um, I will uh, echo that. I actually um, wrote down before you were speaking, um, Dan or Daniel, uh, don't let perfect get in the way of progress. Um, that was kind of my, one of uh, perhaps my leading thought. Um, so I am um, a real estate agent and I used to be in the solar industry. So that's kind of where I'm um, coming from in my understanding of uh, both of, you know, the kind of energy efficiency sector and uh, real estate um, and have been part of a, um, I don't know if we called it a task force that I guess hasn't met in over a year now um, with kind of people in the real estate industry talking about this as it progresses and just have a few, uh, I guess, points to um, a few kind of thoughts on all of this and then a few things that I think, a few things to note that I do think are, um, uh, I guess, things that need to be flushed out a little bit more, um, or at least like thought about. Um, so one thing is, is just that um, I came into real estate thinking that um, people when buying houses would be thinking very deeply about all of these things, would be thinking a lot about their energy consumption um, and thinking about whether or not a house had solar and thinking about whether there were energy efficiency features. Um, and uh, I was apparently too optimistic and it's, I really have not seen, I, I, I can't think of a um, time when I've had a buyer sit down and actually I mean, maybe like two or three times, sit down and talk to me about, um, okay, this is our mortgage payment. And then this is gonna be our electric bill. This is gonna be our heating bill. Like, um, I'm not saying they don't think about it, but it's not in the forefront as much as I was thinking and hoping it would be. So um, just providing that insight to everyone um, in why I think that this is a good step. Um, in giving consumers more uh, information. Um, I also just mentioning in terms of all of the, uh, you know, the seller property information report and other disclosures that we have, um, every bit of that is, is more information. Again, if we're thinking of uh, consumers having as much information as they possibly can, even if it's not all perfect, um, all of it put together uh, is going to provide more information for people to make uh, more educated purchase decisions. Um, also mentioning now this um, hasn't come up, but I anticipate it might that um, I don't see this having any impact on the Montpelier real estate market. There's low inventory. It's very desirable. There isn't nearly new development. Um, I don't I can't imagine someone saying, oh gosh, you know, those energy disclosures in Montpelier are really overwhelming and uh, I don't understand them. So I'm not going to buy a house there. I just, um, I see it being, uh, again, a way to educate consumers more. Um, and I'm not concerned with it, um, at least from my experience, not concerned with it necessarily, um, it, you know, completely diminishing the value of a home or something within context. Um, and if it does, uh, 
then perhaps that's a way of achieving the goal of uh, encouraging people to make their homes more energy efficient. Um, a few um, kind of just points of concern, and uh, some people have mentioned this, but um, I do think that it's important to um, make sure that somehow it's getting recorded with the town because I just, uh, I would have concerns about enforcement otherwise. The, an attorney is gonna be the person who touches every transaction. So I think it's important to somehow, you know, I know attorneys aren't gonna like hearing that, but like uh, if you want to reliably know that it's gonna end up being recorded, it's something the attorney has to do. Um, I don't necessarily know that I'm saying the burden should be on like, and it, you know, the attorney should get in trouble if it doesn't get recorded, but just like a deed, um, you know, I can't see homeowners reliably bringing it to the town or recording it some other way. So in terms of knowing that it's going to happen, having an attorney uh, record it with the town with the deed to me is the, you know, most reliable, going to be the most consistent. Um, I do, um, I guess, still have um, questions about who gets warnings, you know, I, I, there's something about written warnings. Um, so, you know, who, like, who is actually liable for that? So obviously, um, if something's listed with a real estate agent in the MLS, um, the real estate agent is the one who uploads things, you know, the, the, the seller doesn't have access to the MLS to upload documents. So, um, you know, am I getting fined if I'm not uploading things? I'm guessing it's on the seller. Um, but I, I appreciate seeing that just clarified and, um, you know, who, like, who's getting a ready warning and who's paying something, uh, you know, who, who is ultimately responsible for both um, the, like, including it with the listing aspect and then, of course, the um, recording it aspect and, I, I guess, the truthfulness of it, although I guess that's maybe something we're not sure about yet, whether there's some enforcement with that, you know, people, I don't know, people are going to lie on all kinds of things. So to me, someone lying about their energy disclosure is not anything new. They're going to lie somewhere else. They're going to lie there. I, you know, I don't see it as like a new way for people to lie about things. Um, and the, the only other questions I have are, I think I heard someone say something about a cost to use it in the listing and I'm, uh, just curious uh, what that means um, and it was also going to note that um, you know $45 to record something on top of all the other closing costs um, I don't mean to say it's nothing but like a, a you know a buyer isn't looking at the the closing disclosure and you know, they're, they're probably a little annoyed about all the wiring fees and stuff, but like, it's not, um, it's not, the $45 is not going to break the bank in terms of closing costs. Um, and I, I guess the, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm like looking at all my, my notes, which have become more jumbled as I write notes to, to other things other people have said. But the other thing I just want to mention and back to thinking about compliance is, um, just noting that, you know, a lot of what, uh, in terms of real estate agents, a lot of the rules we follow are either uh, state law or um, realtor code of ethics. And this one is, um, I, it's harder for me to see real estate agents having any liability um, because of it, because like we aren't really uh, regulated through any towns. You know, there are a few towns that have specific things, um, but not that many. Like they're, uh, Burlington and St. Albans have their own, and uh, Barry City have their own um, like code enforcement people, but you know, that's like a very specific multifamily thing. Anyways, um, that's just something that I have some concern about. I know it's there. I'm not, I think that all of this, I probably should have started with, I think all of this is great. I think um, there are things to iron out, but 
I think it's a great idea. It's a great step with all of the effort, especially that's already gone into it. I think it would be silly to just be, you know, say never mind. Um, but I think there are a few kind of details that I'd like to see um, thought about ahead of time. There are things that are going to get figured out with the data and stuff later as we go. And um, I'd like to know a little bit more about mostly like who is ultimately responsible for certain things um, and uh, who gets in trouble with enforcement. Great. Don't let perfect get in the way of progress. <laughs> oh, and Martha, where do you live? Oh, sorry. Um, I live in Barrie, uh, although I am uh, currently in Montpelier. Um, I also just want to note for council, um, we are past our normal time in which we take a break. So I am going to assume that we're just going to take rolling breaks for now because I don't want to stop public comment um, at this point. So just a, just a heads up there. Um, so, and, and again, um, do remember to say where you live. Um, all right, so um, I think up next we have uh, uh, Lori Holt, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I wanna start this by saying I have a degree in plant and soil science, so I'm not looking to trash the earth. Um, I think that a lot of what I'm listening to um, not just in Montpelier, but in general, has to do with private property rights and the ability for homeowners to be able to have the peaceful enjoyment of their own property and choose to improve it um, at their own pace and prioritize how they spend their money on their home. Um, I think that strapping a seller with this need, you know, facing penalties and enforcement, using public databases of information that aren't always accurate um, and, and being held accountable are, are issues for me. Uh, there's nothing keeping consumers who buy houses from doing energy audits and doing, um, having a home inspection to determine actually what what they have there that they're considering purchasing. I mean, I talk to sellers, you know, they'll drag me upstairs to show me one new window that they put in, in 1974. Um, you know, when I ask them what sort of insulation they have in their house, you know, they look at me like I've got three heads. You know, are, are, your, are, are your appliances energy of star? It's like, well, I don't know. Some of them were here when we bought it and, um, you know, if if they replace if they replace one, do they have to do this all over again? Um, it just seems I, I kind of put this on the same level as the smoke detector and carbon monoxide certification, which is required of sellers to provide minimum standards at closing. If it's that important that we all be energy efficient, then why wait for a transfer? Just like if people are, are dying in houses that burn down because people don't have smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors, why wait until a property sells to just, just actually have to mandate their presence? I mean, I've, I've seen houses in town that have been built since the 1960s that don't even have one, one smoke detector in them, not even the old crusty yellow ones that you know were the original ones that went in. It just It just seems like it's a bit of a of a of an overreach by the city council members. I I I I live in East Roxbury now. I've I've lived in Montpelier. I grew up in Montpelier every single day except during the governor's orders that I sold real estate full time in Montpelier for the past 36 and a half years. Um, I did so in Montpelier. I've been a property owner there. I sold. Um, it just I mean, how many how many people on the council have actually used this software, and have you had any difficulty understanding it? I mean, some people are just into their appliances and their efficiency. Not everybody, um, and I just it just seems like if you're going to start in in you know enforcing this 
on people and suggesting that the city or the brokers can help homeowners fill this out when they put their house on the market is just creating liability for the city as well as the brokers who probably aren't going to do it because they don't want it to come circle around and whack them. You know, is a homeowner held responsible if they don't know the square footage of their house or they don't know, um, you know, our values or, or how to fill out this form. If you've got two new windows from the 1990s, three from the 1970s and the rest from, you know, before 1930. Um, I just don't understand why all this should fall on the seller who just wants to sell their piece of house when there's plenty of consumer protections for buyers who actually are using the utility bills as their primary reason why they should buy one of the six houses currently for sale in Montpelier in any price range. Thank you. Uh, all right, so uh, Corby Griffin, you're up next, but I also want to recognize Ben Huffman. You've uh, had your hand up, so you'll be after uh, Corby. Well, we got Stephen Whitaker as well. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, Stephen, is it okay if you go after Ben? Sure. Okay, great. Go ahead, Corby. Hi. Um, I've just got a, a few questions and a few comments that I want to make, too, um, and I'm, I'm cognizant that this is dragging out for a lot of people, so I'll try to be quick. Um, my first question is, how much do you genuinely anticipate this ordinance will actually accomplish towards att attaining our net zero goal? Because, um, I mean, listening to it, it strikes me that it's a, a real mountain out of a molehill kind of thing. This is This is small potatoes towards that goal it seems to me um and and with very with what seems to me to be very little benefit and a great deal of cost that's <laughs> already gone into trying to accomplish this I, I i'm just questioning you know why the council even began began this you know where did you think i mean I don't think Montpelier sells all that many homes in a given year. Um, this just strikes me as being yet another example of the council spending taxpayer money that they really, it's, it's not well thought out and it's not well planned. Um, and I'm, 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 you know, I go on outside, I drive my car on the streets, the streets are, trash um our sewer system is falling apart you're not spending money on infrastructure you're spending money on committees like this and and i'm just <laughs> i'm really tired of having our tax dollars going towards <sighs> I hate to say frivolous because I, I really do believe deeply in um, achieving in, in, in getting away from fossil fuels. I just think this has been a tremendous waste of time and energy um, for a very small uh, achievement. Um, and, you know, but if you are insistent on passing this, ordinance, um, my, my next thing would be, we absolutely need to have a cap on it. I think it's unfair um, in the extreme, you know, if somebody's house happens to be on the market for, as Dan was saying, for a thousand days, that's, um, that would be $25,000 worth of, of fees if for whatever reason they didn't, they didn't do this. Um, I'm also concerned for people who are on the lower end of the spectrum um, trying to sell a house, you know, as all of the stimulus money goes away as the, we come out of the pandemic, if we do indeed come out of the pandemic, um, as the stimulus money goes away and, and uh, forbearances go away and people are forced to um, perhaps sell their house before it gets foreclosed on. This is just yet another burden 
for for the people of Montpelier, especially the lower classes, um, people who are are not making great money. Um, and I'll leave it at that. But I, I'm just really tired of the city council spending its time and our money on things that are not directly benefiting the people of Montpelier. And I'll leave it at that. Right. Thank you. Things that I would love to address in, in what you said, but I'm going to uh, hold off for now. Um, and uh, Ben, you can, are up next. Can, can I interrupt for just a second? I can't figure out how to add myself to oh. the... I want to. I want to say a couple of things. Okay. And I can't um, figure out. Can you put me on the list? Sorry. Yes. Um. You can go after Stephen Whitaker's. Thank, Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Ben, Mayor Watson. Uh, yes. Peter Tucker here, and I have the same challenge. Okay. Thank you. All right. So right now the order um is uh, Ben, uh, and then Stephen, and then Jeff, and then uh, Peter. Uh. Okay. Go ahead, Ben. Okay, um, I'm Ben Huffman. I live on uh, Cliff Street. And um, as council members know, I've sent them a pretty detailed review and set of recommendations regarding the profile. And uh, the comments I've got are focused on the profile as opposed to the various other dimensions to the proposal. And I, I want to say that I too have in the past shared the thought that this was an idea that was of lesser magnitude in, in addressing the severe problems that we have with climate change. But I'm also aware that uh, at the state level, uh, particularly among the groups that are now in charge of um, setting the agenda on the topic of climate change, that the labeling has become one of the key things that uh, will become promoted throughout the state and that Montpelier is being looked to as a, a modeler for that, <clears throat> which then makes it, I think, very important to look at this as a, a more serious matter than it does appear to me as well, considering that we sell in Montpelier around 100, 100 homes a, a year, single family homes, out of a total of, um, you know, total units, living units in the, in the city are around 4,000. Um, so my comments are based on the fact that I've uh, done a, I've done my own filling out and completing of the profile. And it is, seems clear to me that the, the, the profile really does that. Head Squad. Okay. Uh, it's clear to me that the, the, the profile needs significant revisions if it's going to measure up to the various objectives that the overall proposal has, including the critical practical one of influencing real estate market values. And uh, I see there to be two general problems with the uh, proposal at this point. One is I think in an effort to minimize the burden or cost um, or even the relevance of it to the market values uh, by proponents has really um, trivialized in a way the overall proposal in a way that is counterproductive. Examples of that, I think, are making the repeated reference to what a pro profile is as equivalent to the miles per gallon stickers on cars or the nutrition labels in grocery stores, as well as saying that it takes no more than 10 or 20 minutes to fill it up. It seems apparent to me that probably most sellers and buyers would find uh, it and, and would be incredulous to the idea that they should spend not more than 
10 or 20 minutes to this presumably important factor in deciding on a transaction transaction of hundreds of thousands of dollars, which in a consequence of which fundamentally alters the course of their lives. And in a similar way, I find the profile itself in its effort to produce a single global number, which is based on lumping together every type of use of energy in a home, really um, produces something that is inscrutable and of not much value. Um, for example, you know, the energy use of space heating or cooling clearly has a direct relationship to the energy efficiency of a building envelope, but very little else of what we use energy for in the house does that. And um, I don't want to go into much more detail, but I would just say that many of the thoughts and remedies that occur to me are in the written document that I've uh, submitted to the council. And then in general, what I would like to see all of us do is to focus less on the aim of victory through an immediate adoption of the ordinance and instead really devote some serious brain power to creating a truly informative profile that could benefit both buyers and sellers. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, all right, uh, Stephen, go ahead. Um, I almost want to give you a minute to let Ben's comments sink in, uh, especially his closing comment. Um, I was trained as an energy auditor out at the Lawrence Berkeley lab probably in the eighties. And it's a, it's an area that I care a lot about, but I also care a lot about Montpelier. And this really strikes me as more of the self-congratulatory, uh, pretentious, uh, you know, $4 million bike path bridges and if, while we can't keep our garbage and our sewage out of the river or create public toilets or fix our sidewalks. So I kind of resonate with a guy, you know, two, two speakers back in the misplaced priorities. Um, I have issues with the privacy of the data, uh, the secret proprietary algorithm. Are we doing this to make a particular you know, algorithm owner group uh, successful, or are we doing this, you know, uh, as a statewide initiative? So possibly we should consider if, if, if this is something the Climate Council is dealing with and looking to Montpelier as a leader, we can probably find some state funds and, and have our own public algorithm. Um, but the and this is a good segue into your next agenda item too. The the privacy of the data is a, something I raised at the first meeting of the homelessness task force, and they have yet to deal with the fact that people don't want to just spill their data. Trust us, we won't sell it. We'll take care of it. And the board that was supposed to protect that data for the homeless management information system has disbanded. So, you know, data creeps over time, and uh, data creeps are after it, so uh, pardon the pun. Um, I guess I think we have a lot of other priorities to deal with uh, that we should weigh on. I think there's a leadership role that Ben alludes to about how we could do this maybe over the next six or eight months, uh, develop our own profile and our own algorithm, or maybe it takes a year. Um, I think the state will wait on us to be leaders, or we don't have to lead in everything. Let's let's lead on getting the same plastic and garbage bags boxes from falling in the river that I told y'all about a year and a half ago, and no progress has been made, or some public facilities, or you know, let's let's get our priorities straight and quit, you know, trying to be so politically correct. It's repulsive. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Jeff. There, I've, I've managed my technology. So uh, um, it, it's an interesting discussion. And I, uh, uh, Jeff Fitzgerald, I've been a resident of Montpelier for 36 years. And I've been on the Energy Advisory Committee for many years. I can't even remember when I started, but it doesn't make any difference. I, this has not been one of the things that I have worked on a lot. Um, but I, I just want to respond to a few things. And first is importance. I, I, I think it's vitally important. Uh, I, I don't, I, I just, don't agree with anybody who doesn't think this is a matter of vital importance. So whether the details have been worked out correctly is, is certainly open to debate and discussion. And I agree with that, but this is vitally important. Um, what our homes use for energy is of vital importance to not only the sellers and the buyers, but to the public. And so I think this subject matter is vitally important. Um, I thought that there was going to be a lot of pushback on the idea of a mandate. And I was prepared to say, you know, I grew up when my dad would curse out Ralph Nader because he mandated seatbelts. And now no one is, is really saying that that was a bad idea. I mean, everyone now acknowledges that seatbelts in cars are a good idea. This is a little bit of ahead of its time. Uh, the idea that sellers have to disclose how much energy their home uses is a little ahead of its time. And we should all recognize that. I, I get that. Um, but the idea of a mandate shouldn't scare people if it's a little ahead of its time. The details, as I said, uh, are open to discussion and debate. Um, and on that, I, I just want to say a couple of things. I tried this algorithm and we live uh, in a home that uses no fossil fuels and uses, uh, we produce more energy than we use. And it was impossible. I will, I will say that when we first tried it. And I haven't gone back and tried it again since all of the tweaks, but there has to be, and, and I hope that the people in charge of the algorithm will say that this is true. You have to be able to override the algorithm with your actual data. You have to be able to, otherwise it, it makes no sense because it could be in either direction. My direction would be, no, they're telling me I'm using all this energy and I'm going to show you my bills and I'll produce them. And I'm not using any of the energy you're saying I'm using. Or on the other side, if you're underestimating, you have to be able to say, no, that's an underestimate. That can't be true because these are my actual bills and I can't disclose to the buyer that I'm only using this amount when I'm really using this amount. So that algorithm, has to allow for that. And if it doesn't, then it needs to be corrected, in my opinion. And um, the, the last thing I just want to say is, uh, you know, I've really, I, I'm not sure about this recording thing. And I've, I've said this to Anne, I've said this to everybody. I really think this should be sort of part of this seller's property inspection report. It should be something that the city is requiring that maybe the state isn't and it shouldn't necessarily involve a recording or anything other than this is my energy use you either go with the algorithm you go with your usual bills but this is what my house uses and you have to disclose it to the buyer um that's that's what i have to say Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we've got uh, Peter and then uh, Tim, I see your hand there. So uh, go ahead, Peter. Hi, uh, P 
Peter Tucker. I'm a, a resident of Montpelier, live on North Park Drive. Um, and I'd also like to let everyone know that I am currently the Director of Advocacy and Public Affairs for the Realtor Association. Um, so we've been immersed in this discussion uh, over the past 15 months on the state level with the uh, Building Energy Labeling Work Group. Um, there are two components to that, commercial and residential. Um, you know, what we're addressing here is, is pretty much the residential discussion. Um, you know, one of your local brokers, uh, Martha Lang, uh, has been involved in that as well. And on the commercial side, Tim Haney, um, you know, served in with that board. And, you know, the discussion is, is really exactly the same discussion we're having tonight. And at the end of uh, roughly 15 months uh, in their report back to the legislature, um, the building energy labeling work groups recommended a voluntary approach to using uh, an energy tool. This same energy tool is what's being considered. Um, so, you know, really the, I guess the, where I wanted to start was, you know, what, what are we doing now? And, you know, and then, you know, how is this gonna fix it? Um, so currently, uh, we provide an energy disclosure suggesting to a purchaser that, you know, understanding the energy performance of the home is, is something that they should consider. Um, you know, where do they get that information? And a couple of people have mentioned the seller's property inspection report. And that allows us to provide actual information, uh, the, the amount of, uh, of electricity, you know, the electricity bill, and the amount of fuel used on an annual basis. And I have talked with brokers in the Montpelier community, um, you know, to try and, and, and elicit from them, uh, you know, their opinion on, on, you know, what the approach should be. And, you know, I think that it's a situation where we look at this modeling system and, and just our, you know, need to, to approach it cautiously, I guess. Um, you know, we're providing actual details. I thought the miles per gallon analysis is pretty interesting because, you know, from, from my perspective, miles per gallon is a math equation. Um, you know, if you, if you drive 300 miles and use 15 gallons, it's 20 miles per gallon. You know, it's an actual uh, specific data point. The, the modeling system that, that the Vermont uh, Home Energy Profile is, is based on um, is an algorithm and, it, and it's a, accumulating data and trying to accomplish a um, kind of this standardization process, um, you know, through whatever that particular algorithm is. So um, I have heard from many brokers, you know, concern that, um, you know, that, that we're just not sure how accurate this is going to be. Um, you know, in terms of data security, uh, this, this algorithm does have the ability to auto-populate to certain um, real estate websites um, like Zillow and Trillia. And you know, these, are, these are organizations that we as realtors have difficulty working with. If, if the information's inaccurate, um, it's almost impossible to change. So you know, we would prefer to see the, the council consider a voluntary approach to, to get this program up and running. And, uh, and we can work with that. Um, you know, what's the real goal? The, the goal is to prove that higher performing energy homes are, are, are more attractive and, and command a higher purchase price. Um, you know, that is, that, that is something that realtors can work with. If it's a marketing tool, you know, we can use it as an advantage to help our sellers uh, sell more quickly at higher prices. Um, you know, the concerns that we have uh, are privacy. Um, you know, if it is, if the information is out there and all of our public information was provided to the New England Energy Partnership, um, all the public record information so that they could start to, to build this profile system, um, you know, how does it get disclosed or where does it go? Um, we are concerned about the liability for the seller. Um, there, there clearly, you know, could be misrepresentations um, you know, honest mistakes uh, that could end up, uh, per, you know, causing the, the seller to be liable for misstatements. Um, and then the, the last part really is, is the, the, the property values in the, in the city of Montpelier. Um, 
you know, we do feel that there are many homes that are older. Um, one of the discussions, you know, one of the slides that was presented tonight was about negotiations with the banks or mortgage brokers um, to get better rates or, or more favorable um, terms. But the negotiations that'll go on are really between the buyer and the seller. And if the seller's energy performance profile is poor, the buyer is going to negotiate a better purchase price as a result of that. As a matter of fact, the statement of, of this ordinance says to get a better resident to, for to allow purchasers to better assess residential properties fair market value. Um, this has been a really hot market. So it's you really can't look at the current market or the last couple of years and try and make determinations. Think about the market in 2010, you know, after the, the economic crisis. And, and, you know, then we had plenty of inventory and, uh, and no purchasers. Um, so, you know, so we are aware of that. And then just in closing, um, you know, I, I just ran an MLS search uh, for sales in, in 2020 and 2020 is turning out to be a, a huge year for real estate. Uh, and we sold, we through MLS sold 62 homes in, in, the, in the city of Montpelier. So, you know, at that rate and to Lori's point on uh, fire alarm, you know, time of sale, fire alarm certifications, um, at 62 units a year, it's going to take a long time to, to impact the, uh, the energy profiles of, uh, of the marketplace. And so with that, I think I'll just uh, leave my comments at that point in time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we've got uh, Tim and then Nate, I see your hand. Um, and before you go, Tim, I just want to um, check in with the council, just recognizing the time. And we are scheduled to have um, the Homelessness Task Force uh, give a presentation after this. Um, Council, what is your thought on, um, on, on keeping that and uh, continuing on? Uh, or, or do you think, um, I mean, I, I would like to be able to, to have the Homelessness Task Force uh, present this evening, but just also recognizing that we're, we're, we're running out of uh, uh, conscious time here. Um, what is so so sorry about that, Tim? If you could hold off for a second, um, what what is your thought on that council? Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I, I'm certainly. I mean, because I know a number of the homelessness task force people have been sitting through all of this discussion as well, and I'd I'd hate to say to them halfway through wasting their, I'm sorry, wisely using their evening listening to civic participation <laughs> activities that they have to come back. Um, I think we could probably. Um, I would recommend bumping some of the, the strategic planning and committee assignments um, instead and just make the homelessness the, and the, the, the letters and resolutions maybe the last items of business. And well, when we do have a potential executive session um, mm -hmm. after that, so I think it'd be good to uh, check in about that. Uh, Jay, did you have a comment about that? Um, no, just that I, I agree. I think we should um, hear, hear through this and and still include homelessness task force for sure. But like Dan said, I think there's a couple things we can push off that are just still in place and carrying on. We don't have to worry about for tonight. So, okay. Other thoughts, Donna? Uh, I would guess like to ask the people that are the leads on the homeless task force because if they sit through another 30 minutes of this, it really pushes us late. So I would rather release them and reschedule, but I'd like to hear from them first. Uh, Ken, how do you, how do you feel? Um, that's fine. R Rick left an hour ago because um, he didn't want to engage in further civic edification. <laughs> um, no, but that, that's fine. Whatever, we're, we're happy either way. Um, this you is not very- You are really? Okay. Um, Connor, do you have a, another thought and then Jack? Yeah, no, I, I, along the same lines, Mayor, I think we could probably maybe even do the strategic planning, the committee assignments and the executive session at like a lunch meeting or something in the next couple of weeks. Those aren't items we'd necessarily get a capacity crowd for anyway, so I, I think that might be okay. That's fair. Uh, Jack? Hearing, uh, hearing what uh, Ken said, I would suggest we 
we release them and let them come to our, our next meeting at which uh, the homelessness task force report would be the first item after the consent agenda. That sounds good to me. If that works for you, Ken, then I, I think we should plan on that. Let my people go. Thank you. <laughs> Indeed. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. Um, sorry about that. Okay, uh, Tim, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Ann. So I think a lot of good comments tonight. It's been interesting. I think probably um, rather than repeat things, the council clearly has a lot of good questions. I think a lot of members of the community do. Um, it's not a new issue. It's certainly a topic that's been on the table for more than five years at the state level. Uh, Peter Tucker and I have both worked on that at different levels over the years. And truly with all these questions, the devil's in the details, you know, there are, there's getting this right and really doing it properly. Um, there's just a lot to it. And that's why it's taken so long at the state level to generate this program. Um, at this point, I strongly favor a statewide program for this than monthly or trying to take it on. I don't think as a community, we have the, um, we, the ability to add more staff and, and just to take on one more important task when it's gonna happen at the state level anyway. Uh, and, and I really think supporting that and helping that to happen, I, I think we've all worked on that for a number of years and it's gonna work. I did a, a study committee this summer, a legislative study committee and so did Martha Lang. Um, there is a, a lot happening. It's not a dead topic there. And um, so I really would encourage you to, to flush out these questions and feed them to the state level. Cause I really, I think that needs to happen. So whether the home is in East Montpelier or Montpelier or Berlin or Middlesex or wherever it is, um, we'd all be on the same level in terms of disclosures and what needs to happen. And I think that's how you're gonna get some meaningful results. So um, without beating up all the fine points, like that, that'd be my quick point for tonight is, um, it is an important topic and I don't think anyone's saying it's not. Um, it's, it's really how we do it and getting it right that's important to me. And, uh, and, and in terms of energy disclosures at the moment, they really are happening a lot. I know like 81% of the transactions in our firm when I went through the files um, uh, are using seller property information reports. And within that there's energy disclosure. In most cases, buyers come back and even ask more questions about energy use after they see the seller's disclosures. So um, I, I think there's a lot of positive things happening already anyway. So really what this will do is, is fill in that gap where it's not happening, hopefully. So um, thanks for your work. Thank you. Uh, Nathan. Um, thanks everybody for, I, I've certainly learned a bunch this evening and to the committee that has generated this, uh, appreciate all that work. Um, I think that you know, I've heard this talked about in terms of, uh, you know, a marketing, a marketing tool for, for real estate transactions and a strategy to increase the value of, of homes. And I, I think that speaking personally, my goal for this kind of action would be about behavior change for homeowners like myself, which is, you know, do I choose to, do I choose to spend $20,000 uh, upgrading my bathroom before I spend $20,000 upgrading my uh, energy use or um, insulation? And I think that as much attention as we can focus on changing our energy use as a, as a community and as a, you know, as a nation, the better. I don't, you know, my understanding of climate change is that we can't move fast enough. So uh, I think I'd rather that we default to action. Uh, I hear Tim's point about the, you know, the state is working on this and uh, you know, I'll, I'll believe it when we have a result and I don't see any reason why we can't start here. And then uh, if the state comes up and, and does a good job, then we can, you know, na navigate that at the time. Um, but I think that, I mean, I loved, I loved a bunch of the points. I think there's some complications I would prefer to see energy use reflected in volume or uh, energy units as opposed to, to cash, you know, et cetera. Um, but I'm going to trust that, that y'all are hearing that feedback and that that can be worked out. Um, so just want to give as much support as I can in terms of creating political space for the city council to be aggressive and move forward on something that I think uh, if we lead on, then others will follow and it may actually make it easier for the state to get to 
uh, to get to yes. So thanks for your work and um, that's it. Great, thank you. All right, I don't see any other uh, hands, either digital or, um, oh, Martha, go ahead. Hi, um, I, those who know me will be surprised that I just have one comment, um, but I'm a, a realtor in Montpelier and I have investment property in Montpelier. My one comment is just to reiterate, and I don't remember who said it, but it was with regards to um, having it be in the land records. And I think it's a fabulous idea to, if this all goes through, if nothing else matters, just a certification gets filed. Um, and not the report. And my issue with that is that I'm also, my husband and I build houses, but you do one change in that report and it, it will change the report. So if you've got people going back and looking at old ones, you're gonna just, it's gonna be a cluster. So people are gonna compare. So I think that not only is it private, but I think it will confuse things. So a certification like the smoke and carbon monoxide at closing, I, I think that would be sufficient um, that's the only comment. So everyone had some great points and I'm so excited, you know, for and against whatever you want to call it, but there was some really, this was one of the better discussions. So um, Dan Richardson, I am your biggest fan. Great job. <laughs> great. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? I, I don't see any more digital hands. Um, any physical hands? Okay. Um, all right, there were lots and lots of comments and, and particularly like really interesting comments um, as, as a part of that. Um, some of which I, you know, I, I want to I wanna address and, and uh, you know, bring some of these ideas um, into our discussion. But before I jump in, um, I guess I want to open it up to the council. Thoughts, comments, reactions? Uh, yeah, what are you thinking? <laughs> go ahead, Dan. Sorry, um, uh, and I'm happy to go uh, um, last or second, but no one else is moving. So I, I think there's a lot of really good feedback that we, we've engendered in this conversation. Um, I have a couple of concerns about the way this, the ordinance is written, and I'm, I'm happy to get into the minutia of it, I've had some conversations with people, but you know, I think there needs to be some tweaking. Um, but let me throw out maybe the big idea that I would propose, which is, I, I think one of the concerns that I heard echoed in some of the commentary is um, everybody is supportive, and I actually brought visual aids, two apples. We want to make sure that if we compare them, um, we're doing a comparison of the same. But if somebody does home improvements and sheets their house inside uh, energy improvement, we want to recognize that in a transaction. Um, and we want people to ask these questions as they're buying. I mean, I think every homeowner can tell the story. I can tell the story of when I bought my first house at 28 and how foolish I absolutely was um, in not asking about energy efficiency. Um, but part of this is real estate is perception and it's, it, it's what we perceive the value to be. And I think we have to be careful about how we tread into this. And what I would propose is that, um, you know, I think, uh, finding a middle ground here might be to make this voluntary for at least a year um, to allow some of this testing to go forward for people to opt in and say if they want to participate and fill out this form um, and, and work through it, they can. But if somebody has these issues, th they don't have to. For the first year, we gather data, um, you know, we work through it, and then we have a way of, of 
um, you know, if, if in a year, you know, people say this really doesn't work, you know, we can revisit it, but the ordinance itself would, would obviously envision a, uh, a mandatory effect down the road. And I, I throw out a year, but I don't know if it should be longer than that. Um, but I'll, I think it might be a way of getting this onto the books and getting people trying this system and buying in to it, if in fact it is effective, because I think the point I heard from the realtors particularly was that if, if this was an effective tool, they'd be the first to use it because it would give that benefit to people. And because we were talking about perception and because we're talking about what people believe in, you know, and, and giving it value and not seeing it as a punitive measure, but as a positive one to allow their not, not cause an apple to drop in price, but cause a, a sheathed apple to, to rise um, in value. It, it, it might be something where um, giving that time to sort of test it out would give people confidence in it and to work out some of these algorithm issues. That's my big general comment. I'm happy to go into the minutia, but I don't know at this night, you know, some of some of my smaller tweaks to the language. We're not doing a line by line of this yet. So I'll 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 hold my powder on that. Okay, fair enough. Other comments? Uh Connor, go ahead. Just want to start off by thanking everybody so much for speaking. Um, I think it was a really good conversation tonight. Um, I think it's important to assume everybody's coming with the best of intentions here, right? Like nobody's saying global warming is a bunch of malarkey and we don't have to address it. Um, that's not what I heard anybody saying today. But, you know, like, okay, your house is a very personal thing. It's probably the biggest investment you can make, right? So needless to say, there's going to be some anxiety over this. And I, I think people are raising some good questions. Um, that said, I, I, I support moving forward. Um, I think the community has been very clear over the last few years, making a commitment to getting uh, net zero by 2050. And uh, I, I think to do that, uh, you need to take some bold action, um, an action that actually does put people outside their comfort zones a bit. You know, if you look around the country, um, plastic bag bans, plastic bag incentives, um, it didn't work when you offered somebody, you know, a little bit off their grocery bill to bring their own bags or something. Uh, you needed to ban it. You needed to have fees attached to it. And I think with climate change, um, it's often the case where you need to have somebody who's saying the stick versus the carrot. Uh, the stick needs to be a part of it. And I, I don't think that precludes us uh, from looking at grants, looking at different incentives um, to, to, to move the ball, ball forward. Um, but, but what it comes down to is, you know, yeah, now in a year, we're not going to be a blip on the radar on this if it's 100 houses sold or something. Uh, but we're not looking at the short term. We're looking at the long term. Um, and over the course of 20, 30 years, what I think it does is it, it gets a conversation going, right? It makes people think about this type of stuff. I often think like, ah, I'm a good, I'm a good environmentalist because I recycle, right? No, it's more than that. And when I use the tool, I could see all the things that I needed to do uh, to be better in this regard. I, I can't afford putting solar panels on or something. But can I, can I replace a few appliances? Yeah, I, I can take that step. Um, so again, I, I really appreciate people's concerns. I think we have a lot of uh, suggestions that we can use to make this ordinance the best it can be uh, before we have the next reading of this. Um, for example, I, I think you know Dan raises some good points. I think whether it be a few months, maybe a year of having this voluntary, that gives you time to work on the tool. If there's mistakes, you're not penalizing people over that time. Um, but, but I definitely think we have to do it. I also think, you know, we, we do have to make the cap explicit if that's going to be the case. So people aren't afraid that they're spending thousands and thousands of dollars on this. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I think what this ordinance does is it gives buyers, it gives everybody all the information they need to make an intelligent decision about these matters. Um, so I think it is very important that we move forward, uh, but really appreciate everybody's comments. Um, yeah, I also want to, oh gosh, there's a bunch of hands. Um, <laughs> so we'll go uh, Jack, then Jay, then Donna. Uh, but before you go, Jack, I also just want to echo um, your thanks, Connor. Thank you to everybody who came to speak to that. Thank you for sticking around uh, to to make your comments. We really appreciate that. Um, it's it's really important and, and helpful. Uh, Jack, go ahead. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I want us to move forward on this and I think it's gonna take some work to do it. I have a couple of observations. One is that, uh, you know, who knows what the uh, quality of the algorithms that this uh, product uses is. But um, I, I looked at my, uh, my profile and it showed that I spend $1,310 a year on electricity. And then I looked at uh, my bank records and it turns out that in the past 12 month, uh, months I paid Green Mountain Power $1,283.89. So that's, that's damn close <laughs> uh, based on the inputs that, uh, that I made. And it didn't take me more than 20 minutes to, uh, to create my profile, probably uh, 10. I think people uh, did some, did make some good points and points that should be addressed um, before we're ready to adopt this ordinance. And uh, I know we tentatively have this on our agenda for our next meeting on uh, March 20 or, or April, uh, 14th. whatever it is, 14th. 14th. Um, it's not clear to me that those answers can be, those questions can all be answered and this can be redone in time for our, for our next meeting. So it might make sense to have it uh, at the following meeting rather than at the next meeting to give, uh, you get some legal opinions, get some uh, detail work done on the, uh, on the product. Um, I think Peter Kelman makes a good point about uh, incentives for people to do uh, energy improvements. Um, I was one of the uh, people who uh, worked to create Efficiency Vermont when, uh, when we did it during the time of electric industry restructuring back in the 90s. And um, and I think that the city of Montpelier, it's hard to, hard to imagine, picture that we're gonna have a lot of money to provide uh, incentives, but we do know that uh, Efficiency Vermont uh, is a large operation that provides uh, energy incentives in, uh, in many areas, including uh, space heating and electrical uh, appliances and so that's one of the things that where people can go to uh, get funding for uh, for improvements um, insulation we had an energy audit and got a lot of uh, benefit from efficiency Vermont uh, for that um, so and and the last and I, I really want to give great credit to, to Anne, especially for pushing this for many, many years he, uh, from the, probably the first meeting when you were mayor and, and on from there and, uh, and Lauren and, and Kate Stevenson and everyone else who's been working on this. I think we're moving the city in the right, right direction. Um, I'm open to considering the idea of this being uh, voluntary on it for a temporary period. Um, and I do not want to foreclose uh, discussion beyond me, but I, at this point, I will make a motion that we uh, schedule a second hearing for on this proposed ordinance as it's now written for two meetings from tonight. I'll second. Okay, so that just to be clear, I think that would put us at the April twenty eighth meeting, um, and I'll I'll just uh, you know I'm not I well I have my own thoughts. Lauren or uh, I'm not sure if Kate is still here. 
Um, yes. So I, I guess, uh, Lauren, do you have any thoughts on having it be on April 28th? I think that's fine. I mean, I think there were great questions and I think, you know, making sure that there's really good answers, uh, which I think there are, but making sure they're compiled and that um, any suggested changes to ordinance language could be, you know, ready to go. I think having extra time, I think a lot of what we heard tonight was let's get this right. And we are, you know, wanting to do this in a way that, you know, if we're going to move forward, that is creating a good model and is going to be as effective as possible. So I think, I think taking time makes sense. Yeah, and I think I would agree, you know, having because the, the energy efficiency working group is going to want to meet again to to debrief this and tweak language. And if we need to go uh, to back to the city's lawyer at all, I think that um, extra time would be helpful. So I, I think that, that seems good to me as well. Um, uh, uh, so let's go uh, Donna and then Jay, you had a or actually uh, Jay, you had a, a comment. Uh, previously, if if it's okay, uh, just to keep with the original order, Jay and then Donna, go ahead. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't want to be redundant. I do think that, um, uh, and yeah, taking more time on this is fine. As if Lauren and, and Kate are okay with it, I think that uh, for me. Um, If we if we move forward with this, the it, it will be successful if the report that's created by going through the process is accurate. And what I'm hearing from folks, um, from Jeff and from Ben, you know, we all got the the very detailed email from Ben, is that, you know, the the way we heat our homes in Montpelier and in Vermont, in Vermont is very nuanced. We invest a lot of our time and energy and money into finding the most efficient and often um, uh, ener not only financially efficient, but also energy efficient ways to heat our homes. And what I'm hearing, I heard from them, and what my experience was in filling out the form was that while the, you know, and I don't want to, I don't want to just write it off to algorithms because a lot of it is about how the, the questions and how they're asked and what, you know, how that whole process works was it, it didn't really leave a lot of room for, nuance. Um, it felt kind of obtuse in terms of the questions and just wanting to very be very general and to be able to create uh, a report that was understandable and something that could be, um, you know, just easy to digest and, and to work with. And so I think that part of what we need to, when we're thinking about is beyond just the language of the ordinance itself is listening to folks who have used this and, you know, Jack, I wish I came in within like 50 bucks of what my actual costs were, but um, that wasn't my case. And I, I know hearing from other folks that wasn't their case as well. So I think that trying to be able to add, add some depth to the questions that are asked to, you know, help develop more accurate answers so that um, folks who are filling it out and they're selling their home are, you know, feeling like they're being acknowledged and recognized for the work they've put in to make sure that their home is uh, heated, is heated and, you know, the, the, how they're keeping the lights on and, and all of that. So that's recognized. So I do think that that's just a really important part of this process that ultimately that will make this initiative successful. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you for waiting, Donna. That's all right. I just had a question about Jack's motion, but I'll do my points and then I'll ask the question about Jack's motion. So um, first to me, I think it's really important that the app for the home audit will take an override. Otherwise, you're going to really not have very much accurate data for all the exceptions. And I think it's important to Dan's point about we better understand the public record aspect. So I would be preferred that it is voluntary for a while, but that we build in some incentives and that we work with Efficiency Vermont and have them maybe link people to us, that there's a way to give a benefit built in that helps people do what they wanna do and also start this data bank. And I think if we go mandatory, I really would wanna cap that. And so I was really uncomfortable when Jack says he made the motion to accept 
the material as read today versus just making a motion we move forward with the second hearing. I'd be much more comfortable with that motion and allow some tweaking maybe for some of these points. You want me to answer that? Yeah, go ahead, Jack. Yep. I, I think that I, I could be wrong, but as I understand the process, if we're scheduling a second hearing, it's going to be on a particular proposal. And this is the proposal that's before us now. But I. We've always changed stuff from one hearing to the next. That's why we have them. Exactly. And I that's what I would expect to see. Oh, but what you're saying is that you would ask the, the committee or to come in with a redraft and that's what we would see at the second uh yes that we would take hearing. in the comments we heard and then apply them to the second hearing that's why okay. i was surprised you restricted it okay i think bill has an answer yeah i think just as a matter as a matter of process um you know you have an ordinance before you you haven't amended it so you're going to hold a second hearing on that ordinance you may come in with an amended version which you could move to amend at the second reading you can you can hold you know you can make amendments at the second reading you can hold a third reading uh, so so the fact that you're just moving this to a second reading doesn't preclude you from making any changes in the future if somebody drafts a change in advance and circulates it you can just substitute this whole one for that whole new one so i think you haven't given up any flexibility from a process point of view bill sorry uh, um, go ahead go ahead Jen we we would want to go past the first reading which in, in other words if we wanted to to tweak this but not go past it, the, the normal process would be to put it past the first reading because we can always have a third or additional reading if, if necessary uh, but it's the idea that we've gone through this particular first hurdle even if it's not in a form that anyone's ready to vote on uh, for final approval is that right, Bill? Okay. Yeah. I just don't remember us ever restricting it before. I just always heard the motion that we move forward to the second hearing. That's all. So my misunderstanding. Don, Donna, and not to belabor this, but when you move forward to the second hearing, that is exactly what you're doing. You're moving the, the ordinance as drafted to the second hearing. I think Jack, Jack just phrased it differently, but it's- Yeah, that concerned me. Thank you. I think we're, I think we're on the same page though. Um, okay, any further uh, comments on this? Yeah, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, just wanted to start, like, I'm so grateful for the participation and the really thoughtful feedback. Um, and, you know, we've heard it echoed by all the counselors, but I, I just thought it was a really productive and um, I appreciate that everyone came in with really kind of concrete and um, really helpful feedback. Um, and, you know, I mean, to me, I just come back to, you know, as a, as a community, as a council, as a state, we've declared a climate emergency, we've established a net zero goal as a community. And to me, this is a modest step, but a valuable one towards that goal. And we have to be willing to, to move forward with actions that are different than the status quo, and actions that are not voluntary. Um, we've seen from decades of evidence of voluntary climate measures, they do not work. I'm totally happy to, you know, do a trial period and like work out the kinks and all of that, but that can't be our end goal here, which, which isn't what I'm hearing. Um, but I, I think it, you, you will not get the same result from a voluntary program over the long term. Um, you know, the, a, a test run could make a lot of sense for some, um, some period of time. Um, but I, I hope that's not where we end up um, for the longer term. Um, you know, I do think that a lot of, I think the issues that we heard tonight can be worked through. I think it was great feedback. Um, you know, the the positives of where we can end up, where we're helping people have better information when they're buying homes um, and pointing people to incentives and to other ways they can make investments that are going to actually save the money over the long term. They make homes healthier, more comfortable. Like these are all good things that we want for our homes, you know, while also addressing um, the climate crisis. So I'm eager to move forward with this and appreciate the hard work that a lot of people have been putting into it and the really good feedback. 
Um, and, and I do really want to also look into how the city can be um, helping promote the, the incentives that are available. And there's a lot right now and um, have been getting even more information from some of our, our great team as this hearing has been going on. Um, but I think, you know, as a, as a community, we can also make sure that that's front and center so people know, you know, what's out there because there's a lot of really good um, programs to, to help uh, make this really affordable. And for low income people, there's things like free uh, weatherization programs and so on. So making sure that people know what's out there um, so we can be kind of spurring these, these conversations and um, knowing that that's out there. So I, I, I guess I'll just wrap there, but again, really, really grateful for the, the dialogue tonight. Um, yeah, and I just want to add, I, I took three pages of notes <laughs> on all the comments that people made and uh, I, you know, I thought people had some really good things to say. Uh, I want to just call out a, a couple of things. Um, well, just one, uh, uh, so someone uh, addressed that uh, they were worried that we were spending tax dollars on this, on, on getting to this point. And I just want you to, everybody to know that uh, it was a volunteer committee uh, with the exception of uh, our Department of Public Works director, um, who spent some time with us, but we're otherwise, um, I did not have spent any um, taxpayer dollars getting uh, to this point. Um, and uh, also, uh, yeah, I, well, I guess there, there's some, some great questions that people raised, uh, and I think we can incorporate a lot of them into um, some of the the tweaks to the to the language and um, add some uh, either some information or clarity or um, uh, or or just uh, getting more information about the accuracy uh, of of the the tool. I, I should note also there was one other way that in which we did spend some money, which was um, in a, consulting with our lawyer. So um, anyway, so that just want to make sure everybody has has that information. Um, all right, any further comments on this? Okay, um, so there's been a, a motion and a second uh, to have the second reading on April 28th. Um, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, all right, well, thank you everybody and thanks everyone uh, for um, for showing up for this and um, we'll, uh, we'll continue the conversation on, on April 28th. Uh, all right, so just wanna uh, check in um, with uh, council. We have, so we're not doing the homelessness uh, task force uh, presentation. One of the things that we did say that we were gonna do uh, was the letter to support Sustainable Montpelier Coalition and um, uh, after the homelessness task force. Um, uh, Donna, do you want to speak to that? Yes, I'm going to go right to it. I'm okay. going to make a motion that the city council supports the application of the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition to National Life Group Foundation to get money to support CAN's efforts. I'll second this. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? And thank Anne for a great letter. Okay. Uh, no, no further discussion? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed? All right, so we have approved that. Um, thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, so the strategic planning process, um, we were going to punt some of these things. Uh, how, Bill, how long do you think it would take to talk about the strategic planning process? Um, you I'll probably are... ask the person that's going to actually be doing the talking what she thinks. Uh -huh. Karen. Well, it honestly depends on if y'all feel comfortable with my recommendations or not, but my presentation won't take longer than 10 minutes at most. Um, I am game what do you think team where should we put it off to the to the 14th yeah go Great. ahead Dan. i was just gonna say, I'm, I'm i'm all set to go <laughs> to keep going sure other thoughts
Jack, go ahead. That, that's fine. I'm I'm already comfortable with the with the recommendation, so I I'm thinking it shouldn't take too long. Okay. Yeah, uh, agreed with the, yeah agreed. I I I'm comfortable with Cameron's recommendation for for the change of timeline based on what we're you know how we're looking ahead at this year. So um, okay. let's just move forward. Okay, Donna. Well, I'm comfortable with it as long as we can tweak it as we go along and we that's a live document so I'm comfortable with it. So presuming that folks have read it. Um, sorry, I, I guess I'll, I'm going to stop my, my comment there. Lauren, go ahead. Uh, I, I agree. I, I mean, I think revisiting it makes total sense for this year with the same council and given the pandemic and where we are i could see if you've got new people coming on that you would have to probably rethink or offer or you know they might not agree with the, the priorities or want to make sure the other things so i think you'd have to adjust it but i think for for where we are and syncing it up better with a budget um makes total sense for for this year certainly donna well, I'll make a motion. Okay. <laughs> we accept the proposed new strategic planning timeline and process for 20, 2022 to 2023 strategic plan. Thank you, Cameron. <laughs> that presentation went by super quick. <laughs> <laughs> you can so, give it on another day. I was going to well, say, you know, I, I best do presentation for action ever. <laughs> I, I do really appreciate that. I think I think that a change um, before y'all vote just to just sort of flesh that out just a, a bit is is really um, changing the timeline of this really does help staff and I think the community align the strategic and to help y'all align the strategic plan and your priorities along with our budget. It makes it easier um, I think for all of us to understand the budget timeline syncing it with our um, strategic planning timeline, I think will clear up a lot of how it works together for folks, not only um, for staff, but for the community as well. I think it really aids in y'all's conversation with folks about what your priorities are. So I really do appreciate um, sort of the vote of confidence on that. Absolutely. Um, so I did see a second from Dan. Uh, and just want to verify that. Okay. And uh, so there's been a motion and a second on accepting this uh, plan moving forward for the strategic plan. Uh, so any further conversation? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so I think we are good with that. Thank you, Cameron. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> it was so clear, he didn't even need to present it. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. Um, so the next thing theoretically that would be on our, our list is um, committee assignments. Uh, do we want, I kind of feel like we can punt that, right? Like we can punt that um, for another time. Is that okay, team? Okay, all right, we'll, we'll put that on the 14th and then maybe we'll actually do it. <laughs> um, and then uh, all right, other business we were going to do, um, uh, the, we're talk about the, uh, resolution that Lauren, uh, put together. Uh, do you want to talk about that, Lauren? Sure. So did everybody receive it via email? Yes. Um, so I guess I would just say if, if people are okay with it, we could read it for the record and adopt it, or if people had changes that we'd want to discuss, and then we could just read it once and save people's time. <laughs> um, so I guess, it, was there any um, feedback people had before spending time reading it out? I'm sorry again for the not being able to get it together ahead of time. Uh, I, I think it looked great. They had a chance to read it through. To make a motion, Connor. I'd move to pass the resolution uh, condemning attacks and discrimination against Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. I'll second. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. I guess we have a very high density of motions in the last 10 minutes. Uh, 
All right. So the last thing is a uh, possible executive session. Um, you want to do council reports and stuff first? Okay. Uh, okay I do want to let you know that Alec um, had heard your conversation earlier, thought his agenda item was being tabled. Um, it is not time sensitive. It was an update for y'all. Um, if you want to go into executive session for that. So he is not on the call, but if you want me to get him back on the call, I will. So no worries, no pressure, just letting you know. He's as long as here. he doesn't, it, it was not uh, a time sensitive matter, then I think it's okay. We can put it on the 14th. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Donna. I just have a question about the meeting next month. I don't know if you want me to do it now or in my council report. The April 14th meeting, I'm going to be out of state and I, it's a school break for my granddaughter. So I don't know if anyone else has that issue, but I thought I would bring it up. Do you, do you mean like, is anyone else going to be, anyone else going to be away or. Okay. Uh, Jack. I will not be physically present in the city of Montpelier, but I don't have to be to, uh, to appear at this meeting. So I intend to be here. I'm going to the ocean. I don't plan to be on Wi-Fi. <laughs> it's a very cold Cape Cod. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Um, I suggested to Donna that we might want to check just to make sure we'll have a quorum. Fair enough. Um, and no one else is planning on not being present. Um, so I, we, We'll, we'll, we'll just have to carry on uh, without you, Donna. I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, we'll just hope that that because you're the, you're the our our vice president, is that right? So we'll have to make sure that both myself and Jack are here. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, all right. So I think we're on to council reports. Um, and if we can go in the regular order, that would be great. Uh, I'm which... passing. I'm talked out. Okay. Um, all right. Who's next? Uh, Connor. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I can pretty much pass, but I just had a question. I, I think Don is off. Um, are we, we're all set on parklets uh, April 1st or everything's good? <laughs> great. Well, everybody should get out and uh, have a pint or have lunch at a parklet next Thursday, April 1st. Great, thanks. Okay, Jay. You're muted. I know, I, I missed okay, the button. But, um, <laughs> just one very quick thing is uh, good luck to the boys varsity basketball team in the, playing in the state finals on um, uh, at the Barry Auditorium, I think on Sunday this weekend. Um, and and I, I, I do think it's, it's probably worthwhile uh, mentioning that Leo Ruby Williams um, will is 12 points away from reaching a uh, thousand points in his his basketball career, um, and and I think it's also worth mentioning that that beyond his athletic achievements, noting the the impact that he, he and his his siblings have had on uh, Montpelier schools, his older sister um, and his younger brother. And, and more to come, you know, in generations uh, or it, it, as the years go on, I think is, is the, the, st the political stands and the, the willingness to uh, be out front of social issues, I think is um, worth acknowledging beyond something. A thousand points is great and, um, and the state championship would be great and all, but what, what he and his family have meant to, to our, our schools and our city is really, um, I think worth noting. So I just wanted to point that out. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dan. Thanks. Um, just a couple of quick points. One is uh, Jay and I are actually hosting a uh, District 3 uh, Zoom meeting on Friday, this Friday at noon. Um, and if anybody wants to join, they're welcome to email me and I'll give you the Zoom link just to avoid uh, unwanted Zoom bombers uh, from coming in. But uh, we're hoping to have uh, a good opportunity to talk with constituents and talk through some issues to bring back to the council. Um, 
the uh, other is uh, I'm starting to hear from constituents, and maybe this is uh, something to pass along to Donna and, and Bill, is just about various potholes that are forming, particularly on Colonial Drive in that neighborhood. Um, a woman uh, wrote to me about falling into one. Um, and anytime somebody talks about falling into a pothole, that, that uh, suggests there's probably a need for that repair to happen pretty quickly. But, um, you know, it's the season for that. But um, the last thing I guess I, I, I want to say are, are two sort of related notes. And, and, and one is, um, you know, the governor has talked about adding, inviting immigrants to Vermont. Um, and I, I think as a city, we should invite them as well um, in the sense that, um, you know, I, I grew up um, with a, a parent who taught English as a second language. And so we grew up with a lot of immigrant communities and the vibrancy and hard work and benefit to a community that groups bring um, that are pursuing the American dream um, that have fought to come here and fight and to live the American dream, make a community so much better. Um, and, you know, it's not proposing any sort of long term, or, you know, specific concrete steps, but to the extent that we can, um, you know, I think these uh, new Americans and people who wish to become new Americans, um, you know, are really people that can improve who we are as a community. Um, and I certainly support the governor's uh, push for that. And it would be nice to translate that into some, some action. And, and I think we should think, you know, this is really a, a good discussion that we had tonight, um, but it would be good to see um, new housing, um, energy efficient housing. Um, and I was reflecting as I was preparing for tonight on, on the fact that, you know, for 13 years, we sat on a DRB and we did not have a major housing development proposed in the city of Montpelier during that time that wasn't um, something that was um, publicly uh, subsidized. Um, and it will be nice when we're on the other side of this um, to be thinking strategically about what we can do um, to add, um, you know, towards those goals because those two type of new homes that um, give people an opportunity to join our community um, are benefits to us. So that's all, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jack. Thank you. I, uh, I was thinking the exact same thing that Dan thought the other night that we would love to have, I, I think it would be a great benefit to the community to have uh, the doors open to refugees and immigrants. And I feel it's, uh, it's indicative of the problems we have getting an, uh, the shortage of critical shortage that we of housing we have in Montpelier that it's hard to responsibly say well more and more people should come here because we we want to have people to come here we need to develop the housing to for people to live in because this is a great place to live and we can uh, and we want to encourage people to live here so we need to be moving forward on our on our housing goals um, I want to uh, just report briefly on the uh, on the police review commission if uh, maybe Lauren was already planning on doing that but we're working hard we're making uh, we're meeting every other week we're uh, doing outreach to many different segments of the population um, targeted outreach to make sure we're hearing from everybody and uh, and our next meeting which is going to be April 12th, is going to be a public hearing for anyone in the city to talk to us about their, uh, their thoughts, their wishes, their goals, their experiences with the Montpelier Police. There will be notices going on the city webpage and front porch forum. Um, so it will be a Zoom meeting, of course, but uh, we hope to hear from, from a lot of people um, I, I don't have any of the details with me now, but that, that will be coming. And then the last thing is Connor reminded me that Connor and I are also doing, uh, uh, 
Zoom session for constituents tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock. So uh, anyone who wants to email either Connor or me at our city council email addresses, we will uh, get you the link. And that's right. it for me. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, so one thing just wanted to to flag. So one of the things that it was great having um, Congressman Welch here and there is this community project opportunity, but applications are due March 31st. I don't know if there's um, what the what the city's thinking, if there's some uh, potential projects that might be a good fit for getting Montpelier in the queue. I don't know if it would be helpful to try to get the lobbying committee together to just think through what we learned from um, from the congressman and we're at the crossover point session. So maybe we should check in soon um, and see. I just want to make sure we're, we're being as helpful as possible um, in that. And I know there's a lot of state funding discussions and how we're kind of positioning our city as well as possible in those discussions. Um, so maybe the, maybe the lobbying subcommittee can set up a time um, through email. Uh, would be great to do that. Um, and yeah, other than that, just wanted to um, kind of in the vein of Jack's update, um, the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee has also been doing a lot of outreach to to various community members, and just really grateful. A lot of people are taking time and sharing really thoughtful input um, on, you know, their experiences and, you know, suggestions and ideas for um, how we can improve as a community. So really looking forward to, we should be getting um, a kind of set of recommendations sometime in the next, Cameron would probably know, month and a half or so. Um, but there's going to be a community survey going out and some other steps as well. So um, we'll keep people updated. Um, but kudos to, to Cameron, who's kept the staffing um, of that committee going really well um, and looking forward to some really um, hopefully tangible recommendations coming out of that process and just grateful to all the people that have participated from the community to help shape that. Um, and similarly for the police review uh, committee and the, the public hearing is April 5th. Um, and we'll put the details out. So <laughs> just to make that, I was just looking that up. Um, but you. I think and that's being that posted. Yeah, you. yeah. It, but I believe it's posted in all kinds of places. So hopefully people can find that, uh, that Zoom info. And that's it for me. Thanks. Uh, okay. Um, I just have one uh, thing, which is the Mountaineers are hoping to have a season this summer. Uh, and, but it is, at least one part of the uh, things that depends on is them finding host families. So if you, <clears throat> I know that is more complicated with COVID, uh, but particularly if you're in a household that has space and you've been vaccinated, uh, they are looking for people to, to host uh, players. So uh, please uh, get in touch with them. Actually, if, uh, if you don't know how to get in touch with them, you can get in touch with me and I can connect uh, you with the right people uh, if you're willing to host a baseball player for um, for this season this summer. Uh, so that's that's it for me, I think. Also, I'm so thrilled that you that multiple uh, of you are hosting uh, Zoom meetings just to chat about stuff. That seems like a great idea. And um, I think I'm, I'm going to have to do something like that myself. I love it. It's great. Uh, all right. And uh, so, John Odom. I'll pass. Okay. Um, Bill and or Cameron, because you've turned your camera. There you go. Go straight to the boss. <laughs> <laughs> so just a quick report, uh, you know, Council Member Hurl just mentioned the federal money. We've been working this week um, to put together, uh, uh, well, lots of lists, but specifically taking a look at uh, the, so the first thing we did was take a look at the, the projects and equipment and types of budget uh, deferrals that we've done, you know, at the end of FY20 and then this current year and then things that had been, rec you know, sought in the FY22 budget that we couldn't even recommend. So, you know, thinking is, and, and that didn't include positions and those kinds of things. This was sort of, you know, one-time money, one-time, you know, projects. Uh, 
and it was, well, these are the things we would have budgeted for had it not been for these revenue shortfalls. Um, so we have those. Then we you know, looked at some of the bigger projects, the bond projects, we've got to, you know, those put together. One of the, one, we were planning to sort of share that list with the council. One of the things we wanted to hear first was tonight's conversation, you know, get some, a better sense of what is, isn't eligible. And while, you know, the congressman I thought, I thought was very helpful, you know, obviously he doesn't know all the specifics. So it still leaves us wondering about a few things, but I think we have a better idea. The one area that we're still, he kind of gave us an answer, would, and I realize he doesn't know, I'm not faulting him, but you know, so how big are these, these grant things for next week? So we have, you know, we've talked about the C State Street project, which is, you know, it's got water lines, sewer lines, paving, it's a CSO outfall, you know, it's got environmental impact, but you know, all together it's $7 million. So is that something we could apply for? or not you know i mean it's so, so you know we've got the rec center at five million dollars or six million dollars or something you know is that something we can apply for uh, or is it more like the confluence park or is it more like the berry main intersection so the you know it's really all about scale or do we throw in a bunch of these and say you know here depending on how you want to divvy up money here's so any any feedback you have and i realize we've got to have this done by wednesday so i mean i think what we would probably take a staff to a recommendation, send it out, and, um, and I realize you can't have a discussion or decision by email, but at least if somebody says, hey, I don't like this, then maybe we can arrange a quick, you know, short meeting just to talk about that if if you all really want to weigh in. I mean, um, you know, I, I do think, and then so then our plan is at an upcoming meeting, now that we know the amount of money and all those kind of things that we would have on the agenda, this, you know, sort of the use of the funds and all these lists that we've talked about. We've also done, we've also put on things like the public bathrooms and some of these other things that people have mentioned at these meetings. And we've tried to get a pretty comprehensive list of ideas. Um, and if nothing else, it'll be really helpful for our capital planning, you know, going forward. Cause now we, you know, we hope we've got every, everything that's on the table until the next good idea. Donna, go ahead. I'm glad to hear you mentioned public bathrooms. I think it needs to be right up there and on the list priority wise. Yeah. Okay, um, any other comments or questions about that? If we need to call a meeting after you send out that list bill, then we can deal with that as, as we need to. Um, well, it would need to be before Wednesday. <laughs> So, so before Wednesday of next week, right? Okay. The thirty first, right? Thirty first. That's when the that's when the applications do. So if the council really wants to weigh in on this, then it'll have to be probably Monday or Tuesday of next week. Okay. All right. Um, well, I think that is the end of our our business for this evening. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for your patience and sticking <laughs> through this. I want to apologize to Donna because we didn't take a, a real bathroom break, and I said that we would. And I, I, I thought uh, anyway. That's 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 on I, me. I do so. think it's unfair? Do you have to leave the discussion in order to go yeah. to the bathroom? So yeah. I would like us to have a policy that we have a break no matter what. I need policy. Yeah. At, how do, how do you all feel about that? Sure. Sure. I'm seeing some. Okay. So, so maybe like regardless of what we're doing, we like you know, we'll interrupt the public hearing. We'll interrupt, or you know, as soon as those you know the present presentation's done or whatever it is, then maybe like the very next thing is we take a take a break. Um, I I want to yeah. I'm I'm seeing some. Is that okay with it, folks? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> but having had this conversation now, now I will interrupt people so that we do. Um, okay. Thank you, everybody. Have an excellent evening. And uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks, probably. Okay. If not Monday or Tuesday. If not Monday or Tuesday. <laughs> Great work, folks. Okay. See you next time. Have a, have a good evening.